in the NVR Live. Thank you. Have a good meeting, everyone. Thank you and good morning to all attending the RTA's virtual meeting of our board of directors. Uh, the governor's emergency declaration remains in force during the current COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to his executive orders declaring a public health emergency and recent amendments to the Open Meetings Act, we will continue to operate under the permission uh, to conduct our meetings without physical attendance requirements. As head of the public body, I find it's not prudent or practical to hold an in-person meeting or to have staff or any member of our board at its headquarters during this time. So let's review today's guidelines for our meeting. Uh, keep your audio on mute as much as possible to minimize background noise, which may impair the recording. When you have a question or comment, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, the board secretary will call on members who have raised their hands one at a time. When he calls on you, lower your hand and unmute before you begin speaking. When we get to voting, please raise your hand to make a motion or second, and the board secretary will identify who is making the motion and second for our record. After he announces the motion and second, please lower your hands. Any questions at this time? We're getting pretty familiar with this routine. Uh, with that said, I will now call to order the meeting of the board of directors officially. Uh, for the Regional Transportation Authority. Um, I will recite the Pledge of Allegiance, which is customary. Uh, you can keep yourself muted. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, will you uh, please call the roll, please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Director Indelcio. Here. Director Canty. Here. Director Carey. Here. Director Colson. Here. Director Fuentes. Here. Director Gavin. Here. Director Gorman. Here. Director Groven. Here. Director Holt. Present. Director Cotel. Here. Director Lewis. Here. Director Melvin. Here. Director Pang. Here. Director Ross. Here. Director Sager. Here. Chairman Dillard. Present. Uh, 16 present, zero absent. Thank you. We have perfect attendance as we usually do, and I, and I thank the board uh, for the great attentiveness and uh, continued um, perfect attendance. Um, item number three on our agenda is where we're at, and that's the approval of the minutes from the board meetings held on October 21 and the special board meetings held on November 3rd and November 5th, 2021. Um, are there any comments or corrections to these three sets of minutes? Uh, one minute, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I see no hands at this time. All right. If not, um, would uh, I'd entertain a motion in a second to approve these three sets of minutes? Uh, motion by Director Indalcio and a second by Director Garrett. Thank you, too. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Secretary. Yes. Director Carey. Aye. Director Colson. Yes. Director Fuentes. Aye. Director Gavin. Aye. Director Gorman. Aye. Director Groven. Aye. Director Holt. Aye. Director Cotel. Aye. Director Lewis. Yes. Director Melvin. Yes. Director Pang. Yes. Director Ross. Yes. Director Sager. Director Sager. Uh, 
I think Director Sagers indicated yes. Chairman Dillard? Aye. Uh, 16 ayes, uh, zero nays, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And those minutes are approved. Item four is the public comment segment of the meeting. We've asked the public to submit their comments via electronic mail. Um, Mr. LaMarche, have we received any comments uh, that need to be read into the record now? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we've received three comments um, for today's meeting that it was requested they be read into the record. All right. Um, How do you, uh -huh. I'll start with the first one, just go through all three, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, the first one is from Kim Stone, co chair, the Task Force on Transit Electrification. Um, it says, My name is Kim Stone, and I'm a resident of Highland Park and a member of the Climate Reality Project Chicago Metro Chapter. Thank you for the opportunity to comment at today's meeting. As you know, climate change is an urgent issue that must be addressed, and our window of opportunity to avoid the worst impacts is closing quickly within the next nine years. Transportation is currently the top source of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Decarbonization of public transit is a critical step in preserving public health and the livability of the planet. Many public transit authorities of all sizes have already begun the transition to electric fleets, and the time is right for the RTA to take the leadership to put us on a fast track to zero emissions in the Chicagoland region. PACE and CTA have both committed to zero emission fleets by 2040, which is commendable, but it's time to act on those commitments. PACE and CTA proceed with their planned purchases of diesel and CNG buses in 2022 and beyond. These fossil fuel powered vehicles will be on Illinois roads for the next 12 or more years, all beyond the time frame in which scientists say we must take action to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Our transit agency should purchase only electric buses beginning immediately. Electric buses are a fiscally responsible choice. Grant funds and battery leasing programs make the purchase price of electric buses cost competitive with diesel. Battery leasing programs, for example, would enable the purchase of an electric bus without the battery for about the same price as a diesel bus, and operational savings would pay for the battery lease. Electric, electric buses with batteries would save approximately $400,000 in fuel and maintenance costs over 12 years. Additionally, new federal funding available money in Illinois' VW Settlement Trust can help offset the cost of fleet electrification. To meet our climate goals, we need more people riding public transit and transit vehicles must be as clean as possible to limit further harm to the air quality and health of our communities, particularly in the most polluted, highest need areas. Now that electric bus technology has improved and become cost competitive, electrification is a better solution for our environment and public health, as well as the more fiscally responsible choice. The second comment um, is from John Cavalunis. My name is John Cavalunis from Lakewood, Illinois. I am former chair of the Sustainability Committee of the City of Crystal Lake and current member of the Task Force on Electrifying Public Transit with the Climate Reality Project Chicago Metro Chapter. I'm pleased that PACE has an electric bus pilot in their F FY22 budget and a zero emission commitment by 2040. They've clearly made a shift to lower emissions and the impact on climate change by stopping the purchase of any more diesel buses. I am, however, still concerned about the continued expansion of compressed natural gas buses. For a well to wheels pollution grade, CNG is no better than diesel. As we learn more about methane leaks during extraction and transmission, natural gas is no longer a climate friendly option. Additionally, with natural gas prices on the rise, I see CNG as a poor choice financially given the much lower ongoing maintenance costs of electric buses and credits available in the new CJO legislation. In the proposed 22 capital budget, PACE is seeking to fund an additional 51 CNG buses and in later years, an additional 37 CNG buses. We urge you to abandon this expansion of the CNG fleet that is planned in the 2022 PACE budget in later years. Please replace those orders with electric buses. Likewise, I'm also very surprised to see the CTA continuous, continues to pro, um, project extensive purchasing of and reliance on diesel buses. This is harmful from a local neighborhood pollution standpoint, as well as damaging to our climate overall. With the preponderance of diesel versus electric purchases in their FY22 five-year plan, the achievement of a zero emission fleet by 2040 does not at all seem realistic. I call on the RTA to work with PACE and CTA to, to significantly modify their five-year plan to electrify, electrify more aggressively in line with the new landmark Illinois CJA legislation and the infrastructure bill at the federal level. The third comment um, was submitted by Pamela Tate, co-chair Task Force on Electrification of Public Transit, Climate Reality Project, Chicago Metro Chapter. 
My name is Pamela Tate, and I'm the resident of Oak Park. I'm all, also representing Climate Reality Project, Chicago Metro Chapter. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments at your board meeting. When I spoke to you last spring about the urgency of the climate crisis, I noted that transportation is currently the top source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. We are running out of time to pre prevent even worse impacts of global warming than we have than we have been experiencing recently, fewer than nine years. Decarbonization of public transit is a critical step in stopping and reversing global warming, and you can make a difference by ensuring that the transit agencies here are making the right budget decisions to put Chicago land on the path to quickly reaching zero emissions. What I did not emphasize when I presented to you in the fact presented to you is the fact that electric buses are also a more fiscally responsible choice. Federal grant funds that will be available through the new infrastructure bill and battery leasing programs make the purchase price of electric buses cost competitive with diesel. Battery leasing programs, for example, would enable the purchase of, a purchase of an electric bus without the battery for about the same price as the diesel bus, and operational savings on fuel maintenance would more than pay for the cost of the annual battery lease. But even if the agencies bought the buses with the batteries included, they would save approximately $400,000 in fuel and maintenance costs over 12 years. One of my colleagues on the task force, Bruce Mainzer, talked with Director John Kim of the Illinois EPA to suggest a creative solution for the use of state funds that are available through the Illinois VW Settlement Trust. Instead of purchasing an entire electric bus, Illinois EPA could just fund the capital cost of acquiring the bus batteries, which would make the capital acquisition cost of an electric bus the same as a fossil fuel power bus, powered bus. Assuming each battery would be the cost of approximately $250,000, this could fund the acquisition of 156 electric, electric bus batteries that this year. Although both PACE and CTA have committed to a zero emission fleets by 2040, I was dismayed to see that CTA, the CTA budget is calling for the purchasing of up to um, 1,280 diesel buses over the next four years while only purchasing 70 electric buses. This is 18 diesel buses for every electric bus. These diesel buses will be on, the road, on our roads for the next 12 to 15 years, and we do not have that window of time to decarbonize. This is totally unacceptable. PACE's budget is also problematic. It is calling for PACE's, PACE to purchase 88 new fossil fuel compressed natural gas buses in the FY22 capital plan, and PACE also wants to go forward with a bid to manufacture 40 CNG buses this year. We know that CNG buses are even more damaging to the environment because they emit as much or more greenhouse gases as diesel buses when taking into account the methane leakage during production and transmission, as well as tailpipe emissions. Clearly, these agency budgets do not reflect a meaningful commitment to zero emissions. In fact, they're going in the wrong direction. If you approve these budgets, the buses will be on Chicagoland roads for the next 12 or more years. The climate crisis is in fact an emergency and our transit agencies must respond accordingly. If we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, this means that our transit agencies must purchase only electric buses beginning immediately. Many transit agencies in other cities across the US are transitioning, transition, transitioning to electric fleets successfully in both big cities and small, smaller ones. It is time for the RTA to stand up as a leader in protecting our climate and making good financial decisions. We need more people riding public transit, but we also need the buses to run as cleanly as possible to limit further harm to the air quality and health of our communities, particularly in the most polluted, highest need areas. Please take action now to say no to these purchases of diesel and compressed natural gas buses. We need to be on a fast track to zero emissions and we can get, fed and, we can get federal and state assistance to get there. Thank you for your consideration. And that concludes the public comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and and thanks to the uh, three individuals who submitted their uh, their written comments. They're they're well taken. Um, next is uh, item five, which is our executive director's report uh, from Leanne Redden. Leanne. Good morning, Chairman Dillard and members of the board, and uh, thanks to all the guests who have joined us and some of several of whom you'll be hearing from later in the meeting. So this is our third meeting this month, uh, and it brings us together at a time of continued vigilance and guarded optimism. Because of our collective efforts, we have ensured our regional transit systems operational stability for the next few years, securing the time to prepare for what follows ahead. And today is an important step in that preparation as we hear from each agency on their proposed budgets. It has been a busy month. And so before we hear from our guests today on agency budgets, I just have several updates that I would like to cover with the board. So let's begin, next slide. Uh, let's begin with some long awaited good news. 
On Monday, President Biden signed the $1.2 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a five-year surface transportation reauthorization bill that will make significant investment in the nation's transit assets. The bill provides uh, 100, nearly 107 billion, I should say, in public transit funding over five years, which is an increase of uh, just over 41 billion or 63% above the current spending levels. Focusing on formula funding first, uh, while we're still awaiting the formal urbanized area apportionments or the numbers from the FTA, we are estimating that this infrastructure bill will provide an additional 1.3 billion, yes, it's with a B, in additional formula funding over five years for the larger Chicago urbanized area. This is in addition to the uh, over 2.7 billion of reauthorized federal formula funding for the region that will be used, uh, you know, and generated over the uh, over the the expected funding levels current, I should say, the existing spending levels, sorry. The bill contains uh, billions in new discretionary funding opportunities for transit agencies across the nation, including doubling the amount of the capital investment grant funding available to 20, uh, about 23 billion over the five years also. This is the federal program that has funded projects like CTA's red purple modernization work, for example. Also, the new state of good repair discretionary program was uh, created and funding levels were set at 300 million per year. The program will award funding uh, for up to three recipients each year. Uh, additionally, there is new, the new legislation authorizes a new 1.75 billion discretionary program for station accessibility entitled the All Station Accessibility Program which was initially introduced by Senator Duckworth and uh, framed around a proposal and work that CTA had uh, pitched to the Senator. The program is will help legacy transit systems like our region, uh, specifically the CTA as well, uh, to bring their aging infrastructure into ADA compliance. This, uh, and just a, a quick note too, when I mentioned there are literally billions of dollars available in these competitive programs, there is also additional monies, significant amount of monies um, available through programs for uh, electrification of fleets. This investment is historic, it's, it's heartening, and it will absolutely be meaningful to, and have a real meaningful impact to our region. So turning to Springfield, uh, the Illinois General Assembly met late October for a two week fall veto session. And while in session, the House and Senate passed a bill that provides the RTA region with three years of temporary recovery ratio relief for 21, 22 and 23. The bill will provide a waiver so that any regional budget adopted during the three year period would not need to contain a 50% fare box recovery ratio. Additionally, the bill provides a waiver from the financial penalty the region would face if it failed to meet the 50% recovery ratio during that same period. The bill has yet to be signed by the governor. Uh, we don't have any concerns about that. Uh, the bill has, is just on its way to his desk uh, and we will keep you updated on any new developments. So moving on to the next slide. Last month, the RTA conducted its annual call for community planning projects conducted jointly with the Chicago Metropolitan Plan Agency for Planning. 70 uh, total applicants were received from 50 applicants across the region. 15 of those have a transit focus and will be considered for the 2022 community planning a program of projects that we would bring to you next year. Transit oriented development planning assistance was again the most frequent request uh, of the RTA with six, six applications received, followed by five applicants requesting transit focused corridor studies. Technical assistance related to neighborhood mobility, zoning code updates and developer discussion panels were also requested. 11 applicants were from Cook County, 
two from McHenry County and Kane counties. Both the RTA and CMAP targeted applicants uh, of high need, resulting in five applications to the RTA uh, for areas in this region uh, to be considered uh, that are considered to be both high and of very high need. Staff will continue to evaluate those applications and conduct interviews through November and December. A staff recommendation will be open for public comment in late January, followed by final selection uh, and for your presented to you for your consideration at the February board meeting. So next slide, please. And just a quick transition uh, on the strategic plan. I just want to briefly note that we are midway through the first phase of its development. Uh, focus largely as we've been talking about on identifying issues and priorities with an emphasis on gathering stakeholder input. So next slide. Our engagement efforts uh, grouped under the name Making a Plan have included guest speakers before this body, uh, publication of almost a dozen guest blogs from transit thinkers across the region. And last week we hosted a public forum with the Urban Transportation Center at the University of Illinois Chicago, featuring three leading researchers and advocates from national and local organizations to discuss broad ideas for reimagining regional transit. What we heard there echoes what we have heard elsewhere that we cannot waste this opportunity to leverage transit's unique ability to improve equity, mitigate climate change, and contribute to economic access. And we must do so by centering these needs on all riders. Coinciding with this forum, we published our first broad public survey to gather input on the strategic direction of the regional transit system. Anyone can access it from the homepage of our website and we plan to share it widely and ask others to do so also. So uh, board members, happy to get you that link so you can share it uh, broadly and widely. Uh, this winter, we will see further opportunities to gather input and a preview of how we'll approach transparent and accountable engagement throughout the development of the strategic plan. So next slide. Turning to the core of today's meeting with an overview of the regional budget. Uh, overall, the proposed 22 regional transit operating budget totals approximately 3.4 billion, an increase of 4.6% over the financial plan for 22 adopted pre-COVID. The six county system proposed five year capital program totals approximately 5.3 billion which is 17% less than the uh, previous five-year program of 21 through 25, because that uh, was the last of the programming of the Rebuild Illinois funds. Uh, also, the new federal infrastructure funds are not yet included in the five-year capital program. So just a note on that front. I have been visiting each county to present on this budget and discuss our continued COVID recovery strategy and will continue to do so through early January. Following this meeting, the board will be subject to a public comment period, uh, sorry, the budget <laughs> will be subject to a public comment period from November 19 through December 15, and we will hold a virtual public hearing on Wednesday, December 1st. Uh, on December 16, we will be back before you, the board, uh, for your approval of the proposed budget. And as you're aware, over the past two years, we have distributed approximately 3.4 billion in federal relief funds to the service boards to make up for lost public funding and operating revenues uh, resulting from the pandemic. The continued work to support recovery through the most efficient use of available dollars will mean that the budget uh, you will consider will likely require almost immediate amendment in the first quarter of 22 to fully reflect the allocation of federal relief dollars. And further, our role as stewards um, of this funding demands that we continue to carefully monitor the drawdown and the use of those dollars and take action as needed to sustain critical transit operations across the region. You will also Continue to be apprised and engaged via our monthly and um, quarterly financial reports 
requested for action as needed. So next slide. Uh, today, also, as we've noted, you're going to hear from CTA Metro and PACE and the RTA staff about each agency's proposed budgets. Following that, we will get a summary uh, of the November meeting of the RTA Transit Access Citizens Advisory Board from Pe Chairperson Jackie Forbes. That will be followed by a quarterly performance report spotlighting the three goals of the current strategic plan and some highlights including trends in operating costs and fair revenue per passenger trip. Uh, an update on the Bedford Park uh, mobility pilot and an updated customer satisfaction survey information. We will then ask for your approval on the thir third quarter financial results and one contract for managed hosting services. And finally, we will ask for your vote on a resolution honoring uh, PACE Executive Director Rocky Donahue for his 40 years of service and leadership. <laughs> And just a few weeks ago at an event hosted by the Atlanta Regional Commission here in Chicago, uh, Rocky, Jim, Dorval and I gathered in Evanston, all of us in person for the actually for the first time in two years. Leaders from Atlanta were there to hear us discuss uh, how we have collaborated through the pandemic and we had plenty of examples to share with them. And I look forward to our continued collaboration to fin finalize this regional budget and work on the important work ahead of us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will turn it back to you. I think you're muted. Thank you very much. If uh, are there any questions uh, or comments uh, on Leanne's report? I see no hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then we will go on to uh, item six which is the presentation and discussions of the 2022 agency uh, budgets. Uh, we'll begin with uh, the CTA. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dillard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the RTA board, good morning. Uh, I am Dorval Carter, the president of the CTA, and joining me here today are Jeremy Fine, the chief financial officer, Michael Connolly, my chief planning officer, Tom McComb, the Chief Administrative Officer, and Michelle Curran, the Vice President of Budget uh, and Capital Finance. It is our pleasure to address you to discuss CTA's proposed 2022 budget. As you are all aware, for the last 20 months, public transit has been a lifeline for communities across the Six County region. And with each passing month in 2021, transit's important city region's reopening has grown. Since January, CTA's daily ridership has nearly doubled as people, people return to the office, to school, to events, and to other aspects of pre-pandemic life. In fact, CTA is approaching 60% of its pre-pandemic ridership, a number we anticipate will grow in 2022. That is why CTA has continued to run as much service as possible throughout the pandemic, while following the extensive and ever-evolving guidance of local, state, and federal health officials protect our customers and employees. To put it simply, when the region needed us, we were there. Of course, the loss of ridership CTA has experienced has taken a significant toll on our budget bottom line. For 2022, CTA is facing a $456 million deficit in our operating budget. Fortunately, we have been able to offset the unprecedented loss of fare revenue thanks to the federal relief funds designated for public transit nationwide. That federal funding, which will total over $2 billion, has enabled the CTA to continue providing the service the region has relied on. Federal funding has also allowed CTA to provide fare reductions to incentivize ridership. While we are excited to see a sizable increase in ridership in 2021, in part aided by a fare discount pilot we have run since May, we need to continue the momentum into 2022. As such, we are proposing to make the pilot permanent and expanding it to include reducing the 30 day pass price, as well as eliminating the 25 cents transfer fee, which we view as historic equity issues. We are also working with Metro and Pace to better integrate our path products to make it easier for customers to connect seamlessly. The budget also continues to make investments in pandemic safety measures. Even before the pandemic, CTA has had one of the most thorough cleaning regimens in the US. And we have, enhanced, we have enhanced that through electrostatic sprayers, cleaning slot teams, and additional staff devoted to cleaning. 
We've also provided hand sanitizers, free masks, and travel healthy kits to our customers. And in addition, CK is developing a real-time passenger information tool that will allow customers to see crowded conditions as they make their transportation decisions. We are also funding additional security coverage on the rail system to supplement law enforcement provided by the Chicago police. Finally, I am creating two new offices to focus on issues on which I have been especially focused, innovation and equity and inclusion. The Office of Innovation will provide policy, research, and project management resources for innovative technology implementation pilots or proof of concepts across the agency. The Office of Equity and Inclusion focuses on internal equity initiatives as well as further growing our agency's outreach and inclusion efforts with external organizations and communities. We also are still working diligently to deal with our growing $13 billion state of good repair needs. To that end, CTA's 2022 budget also proposes a five-year, $3.5 billion capital improvement plan made possible by a mix of federal and local funding, including the state of Illinois' Rebuild Illinois Capital Bill, which is in its second year. It is critical that RTA and the service boards continue to make the case for additional operating and capital funding to ensure the transit needs of Cook County are met and expanded upon into the future. Among the many capital projects that we will tackle in 2022 are our all station accessibility program to make CTA's rail system 100% vertically accessible, refreshingly new and expanded and accelerated rail station improvement program, Blue Line Forest Park Branch track and power improvements, the first phase of a comprehensive rebuild of that branch of the Blue Line, and Better Streets for Buses, a comprehensive citywide plan for bus priority streets. We are also aggressively pursuing the CTA's commitment to complete the electrification of our entire bus fleet by the year 2040. And, and I should point out that an undertaking of this magnitude does take years, but also requires thoughtful and comprehensive planning. In addition to just purchasing the buses, which is only a part of the equation, we also must put in place a comprehensive charging infrastructure and extensive electrical power upgrades across the entire service area as well as all of our garages and terminals. As you know, CTA was one of the first agencies in the country to commit to transitioning to an all electric fleet, and we have already taken many steps to meet that goal by 2040. I should also point out one, one fact that was mistaken in the, in the comments that were given to you earlier. CTA is not in the process of purchasing 1,280 new buses. That is not in our budget. We have a, a modest number of uh, buses that we are procuring as part of our ongoing need to replace aging diesel buses that are well beyond their useful life and for which the carbon emissions and other air quality issues are much poorer than any buses that we could purchase today. We will also continue to work on what will be the largest project in CTA's history, the Red Line Extension, which will extend the CTA's busiest rail line to the southern city limits, providing transit access and connectivity for the far south side of Chicago. Despite the unprecedented challenges posed by the pandemic, we continue to put our customers first, and even as the pandemic lingers, work hard to provide the best possible service for those who need us most in Chicago and the region. This proposed budget supports those efforts, but we will continue to work diligently on our riders behalf. I wanna thank the board for their consideration of our budget proposal, and now I will turn it over to Jeremy Fine CCA Chief Financial Office, who will give you a few more details about the proposed budget itself. Jeremy? Thank you, President Carter. Uh, I'm Jeremy Fine, the Chief Financial Officer, Officer for CTA, and I'll walk through the 22 budget uh, plan, and, uh, and I'm also joined by Michelle Curran, who will walk through the capital plan. On the next page, uh, we have an overview of the uh, 22 budget highlights. Uh, this is a $1.7 billion budget, uh, it does require $455 million of federal relief funds. Uh, that is uh, broken into two components. Uh, it's the re remaining uh, CRISA funding uh, that we will not use in the 2021 year, uh, which is estimated to be about 300 million. Uh, that will be coupled with the ARP funding uh, that we were just allocated by the RTA board. Uh, and we are expecting to use approximately 156 million of those funds uh, for 2022. Again, uh, you know, as, as recently passed, uh, we received 912 million of the 1.5 billion total uh, for the region. 
uh, and we are looking to close the remaining gap uh, with the ARP discretionary funds that we are in position to compete for. Uh, the pandemic obviously has had a tremendous impact on public transportation. Uh, we're expecting that ridership will continue to grow in 2022 by a similar amount that we saw in 2021. Uh, we're expecting it to grow by about 28%. Uh, we saw growth in 2021 by about 29% uh, versus what we saw in April through December of 2020. Obviously, projections of, uh, of ridership are obviously uncertain uh, in these unsettled times. Uh, and we'll talk more about our ridership projections, but we have engaged MIT uh, as we had last year uh, to help us conduct a national survey. And we'll talk about uh, some of those results in a moment. Uh, and then uh, the one of the main components of ensuring that we drive ridership uh, back to pre-pandemic levels as best we can is uh, enacting some of the fare reductions that we piloted uh, earlier in the year to incentivize ridership. And we'll talk more about those. And then finally, uh, the 22 through 26 CIP is a $3.5 billion plan. However, this does not include any funding from the recently passed infrastructure bill. Uh, that will be an additive, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, any type of uh, formula funding flow through, as well as the ability to again compete for additional discretionary dollars through that infrastructure bill. On the next page, we have a highlight of some of the fare uh, reductions that were uh, that we've enacted, as well as looking to solidify and expand on in the 22 budget. Bottom line, obviously, commuting patterns have been impacted uh, due to the pandemic. But what we're really trying to do is incentivize riders to get back on the system, to ride more, and uh, eventually connect more seamlessly uh, throughout the system. Uh, you know, with regard to uh, paper use riders, we're looking to eliminate the 25 cent transfer fee. We're very excited about this equity initiative. Uh, and then we're looking to uh, solidify and make permanent uh, the current pass promotions that we've been offering since Memorial Day on the one, three, and seven day passes. Uh, this uh, earlier pilot has proved to be very beneficial in driving ridership uh, back to the system. Again, getting those people back on the system for the first ride. And once they uh, are on the passes, we're seeing a tremendous uptick in ridership uh, you know, after they have that pass in hand. Uh, we're also looking to expand the offering on passes to include the 30-day pass uh, to make it more affordable and flexible. And again, we'll look for continued efforts to uh, streamline the process and make it more uh, you know, open and accessible to our customers as they continue to come back to the system. We also are working and leading the effort to uh, connect more seamlessly, and we're working with PACE and Metra on integrating all of our passes with PACE uh, and also modernizing uh, the Metro link up and lowering the price. On the next page, we have an overview of some of the customer experience initiatives that we will continue to undertake throughout the 22 budget. Uh, as President Carter said, maintaining full service uh, is something that we've had to do throughout the pandemic and will continue to do uh, to uh, accommodate all of our passengers uh, in a safe and reliable way. Uh, we're also looking, as I mentioned on the prior page, uh, to implement those additional fare reductions, which have been a tremendous boost to uh, driving ridership back to the system. Uh, we're looking to provide additional security through additional security contracts, as well as the Refresh and Renew program, uh, which is improving cleanliness and security through 125 rail stations. We've also undertaken uh, an extensive safety uh, measures uh, with regard to Cleanliness, we had best in class cleaning regimen prior to the pandemic. Uh, we've enhanced that through electrostatic sprayers and cleaning SWAT teams. Uh, we've also supplied uh, hand sanitizer and free masks throughout the system and uh, travel healthy kits to our customers. And uh, as President Carter mentioned earlier, we're also developing a real time projected crowd uh, passenger crowding dashboard that will allow customers to assess crowding conditions before embarking on their journey. And we're also looking to uh, create a customer engagement pilots uh, so that there's a friendly face and hand uh, to help uh, customers as they come back to the system to become reacquainted with the system and uh, make their uh, 
make their uh, trip more uh, safe and enjoyable. On the next page are some of the uh, budget initiatives with regard to our workforce. Uh, we have not had any layoffs, uh, despite you know the impact of the pandemic. Uh, the Second Chance uh, program uh, is a nationally recognized program. Uh, we've employed over 1,500 people with 400 securing permanent employment with the CTA. We're also looking to expand on a very successful program that we had uh, with the RPM program that we rolled out there uh, with regard to workforce partnerships and building small business uh, initiatives. Uh, and we're looking to expand this, uh, this platform to other capital projects as we move forward. The RPM Workforce Partnership uh, hosted over 300 individuals and trained over 200, and the building on uh, small businesses assisted over 20 firms and secured over $5.5 million. Through September, uh, we over $6.5 million in wages have been paid to workers from economically disadvantaged communities, and 71 DBE firms have been used to date. 25 of them are new to working with CTA. We've also had a very robust internship program that we look to continue for both college and high school students. And we're looking to build a first of its kind for the agency, a training facility, as well as a modern control center. And as President Carter had highlighted, uh, we're also creating two new offices uh, to focus on innovation and equity and inclusion. We've been uh, working on both of these areas, but these uh, new offices will expand the platform uh, particularly for innovation, where we'll be looking uh, to provide research and project management resources for innovation, technology, implementations, and pilots and proofs of concept across the agency, as well as the Office of Equity and Inclusion, which will both work internally and externally uh, and uh, to promote equity and inclusion efforts uh, with external organizations and communities. On the next page, we have an overview of our revenues uh, for the budget. Uh, we're expecting to see growth in revenues, as I uh, mentioned with regard to, uh, particularly with regard to the uh, continued efforts to promote uh, people to return to the system. Uh, but you know, the revenues uh, obviously are not adequate to cover uh, the full amount of expenses and will need to be supplemented by the federal emergency funds uh, in the form of CRISA funding and ARP funding. Fairbucks uh, revenues are estimated to be about 50% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and then the non-Fairbox revenues, which we've done a tremendous uh, effort to grow over the past uh, you know, decade, uh, you know, we are not including, uh, as of the 22 budget, the ride hailing fees uh, from the city of Chicago, uh, but we continue to work with our partners over at the city uh, to hopefully get those reinstated at some point in the future. The public funding, uh, is expected to grow 13%, uh, driven by the capture of online sales tax, as well as the restoration of the 5% uh, PTF haircut uh, by the state of Illinois. <laughs> Again, we would like to see the restoration of the reduced fare uh, re reimbursement as well, uh, and if there's an ability to reduce the uh, haircut on sales taxes. Without federal relief, uh, the system generated revenues of 21%, of the total expenses are significantly below the required recovery ratio. Uh, and again, we've uh, worked with uh, the RTA staff on uh, securing uh, temporary um, you know, uh, ability to meet that uh, recovery ratio. Uh, but again, we'll continue to need to see what long-term relief may be needed in the future. On the next page, we talk about our expenses. <clears throat> Those are expected to grow about 6.2%. Uh, which is uh, in line with what you're seeing with regard to overall inflation, uh, as well as Social Security increases. Uh, and last year, our budget uh, grew by 4.8%. Uh, Again, the uh, pandemic and inflation has had an impact uh, as we continue to move through this period. Uh, labor is expected to increase by a similar amount. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, staffing levels, uh, overtime, absenteeism, cleaning fees, uh, and impact on fringe expenses, including health care, uh, continue to drive uh, that line item up. <clears throat> Material expenses are driven by a higher number of parts uh, coming off warranty. Uh, security services uh, you know, are, are seeing an uptick due to the additional security hours that we're planning for the 22 budget. Contractual services have increased due to uh, 
uh, software and equipment upgrades, um, and then uh, that are no longer available uh, to be funded through capital funding. Uh, and we've done a very good job of locking in uh, fuel and power costs uh, at historically low prices, managing our vacant positions, and uh, and other uh, budget measures that have allowed us to save <clears throat> over the last five years almost 170 million dollars, um, you know, from our budget. Over the last 10 years, that's aggregated up to over 330 million dollars. So again. We've done a very good job of belt tightening internally. Otherwise, our budget would have been, you know, almost 20% higher uh, if it wasn't for those measures over the last decade. <clears throat> On the next page, we see the projection through the uh, 24 period. Again, we're seeing uh, estimated gaps between 400 and 500 million dollars. Again, the uh, federal funding is critical here to allow us a bridge to rebuild our uh, ridership throughout this period. <clears throat> and again, we'll be um, looking to compete for those critical ARP discretionary dollars to help close the remaining gap. Uh, ridership has uh, obviously been impacted by the pandemic and we're expecting uh, ridership uh, through the projection period here of 55, 60 and 65% uh, percent, respectively. Again, the recovery ratio relief is helpful, but we'll need to continue to look for, um, you know, what uh, what kind of additional relief we may need in the future. <clears throat> Next page, please. With regard to our ridership, uh, you know, obviously the pandemic's had a tremendous impact on it. Uh, we have, uh, you know, again engaged MIT, uh, who's worked with us closely on a number of projects uh, throughout the agency. Uh, to conduct a national survey as we did last year. Uh, our projections are in line with what you're seeing nationally uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the 22 year as well as the projection years. And again, we're trying aggressively to move forward on uh, the pass and uh, paper use reductions that we discussed earlier uh, to ensure that we drive ridership as best we can back to the system uh, while we have the, uh, the federal funding available. Uh, you know, obviously the industry at large was facing pressure prior to the pandemic, uh, but again, uh, you know, we have uh, seen some sustained growth uh, because of the, uh, the efforts that we've undertaken with regard to our past products. And again, we feel uh, confident in the uh, projection of about a 28% growth uh, for 2022 uh, based on the growth that we've seen throughout 21. And then the next page, please. Next page. <clears throat> With regard to our 22 through 26 CIP program, again, this is a $3.5 billion program that does not incorporate any additional federal infrastructure bill uh, provisions at this time. Obviously, that would be additive uh, and we'll make amendments as necessary. Uh, with regard to the funding sources, uh, we have uh, used federal funds uh, as well as state motor fuel tax funds. Uh, and then there's a component of CTA bonds. Obviously, uh, you know, we would have preferred uh, not to use CTA bonds in the past and in the, for in the future, uh, but because of, uh, you know, just general state uh, underfunding, uh, you know, we have had to uh, incorporate a component of CTA bonds into the capital program uh, over time, as well as uh, as we continue to move forward. Uh, types of projects funded, and Michelle Curran, who will join me here in a moment, will walk through some of these in more detail. But we have major rail line projects uh, such as RPM and RLE, uh, which will enhance capacity. We also have the All Stations Accessibility Program, uh, the modernization of the rail and bus fleets, as well as the electrification that uh, President Carter had mentioned in his remarks, uh, the new control center and training facility that I previously mentioned as well as enhancement on bus priority zones and state of good repair projects. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Michelle Curran, who will walk through the details of the various components of the CIP. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning, I'm Michelle Curran, Vice President of Budget and Capital Finance for CTA. Next slide, please. So the next several slides include some of the details around specific projects in the CIP. 
First is the Red Purple Modernization Project, which is a $2.1 billion project to improve capacity, travel time, ride quality, and safety on one of CTA's highest ridership corridors. Phase one of the project includes three major components, the Red Purple Bypass Bridge, the Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr stations, and a new signal system between Belmont and Howard stations. Phase one is expected to be completed in 2025 and future phases of RPM are in the planning stage. Next slide, please. So this next slide outlines the red line extension to the south, which is estimated to cost $2.3 billion. The red line extension would extend the rail line 5.6 miles from the 95th street terminal to 130th street including four new stations, park and ride facilities, and a storage yard and maintenance facility. We're currently in the project development phase and expect to enter into project engineering phase in late 2022. The all stations, uh, next slide please. The all stations accessibility program or ASAP is a comprehensive 20 year program to make all stations vertically accessible. 103 of CTA's 145 stations, or 73%, are already accessible. Phase one of the plan includes nine more stations to be made fully accessible, including the four red line stations we just talked about as part of the RPM project, the Austin Green Line Station, California, Montrose, and Racine stations on the Blue Line, and the State and Lake Elevated Station. Phase one also includes upgrades or replacements of up to 20 elevators. Next slide, please. The CIP also invests in the bus and rail fleet modernization. Bus improvements include purchasing 600 new, bus, new standard buses, 70 additional electric buses, and overhauling a portion of the existing fleet. On the rail side, we funded the purchase of new 7,000 series rail cars, overhaul work for the existing 5,000 series rail cars, and the purchase of four new diesel locomotives. We also continue to invest in capital maintenance to target needs between overhaul cycles for both bus and rail cars. Next slide, please. Finally, the ICE funds, which will be used in the operating budget, will fund various initiatives, including Refresh and Renew, which is a program targeted at improving rail stations through deep cleaning, painting, and lighting upgrades. COVID-19 Rapid Response Flexible Service, which reallocates bus service to meet quickly changing bus needs due to the pandemic. Professional services related to the safety management system implementation. The When You're Ready, We're Ready marketing campaign to welcome riders to public transit. A substance abuse management application to record drug and alcohol testing results. And a software upgrade to provide better data on ridership demographic information to better inform ridership recovery efforts. That concludes the presentation and we'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Jeremy, Michelle, President Carter. Um, you uh, always uh, amaze me on how you, 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 you operate so well under very, very difficult uh, historic circumstances. Are there questions uh, or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, Director Andalcio has a raised hand. Yes, Director Andalcio, morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna echo your words. Uh, I wanna commend CT on the streamline of their budget. Um, I had numerous budget questions, but most of them were answered. So um, considering, con considering your demographic makeup, um, what is the plan to increase both employment and business opportunities for minorities, including veterans, DBE, and WBEs, in light of this new infrastructure funding you will receive? Thank you for the question, uh, Director. You may have heard the discussion during our presentation about a number of workforce initiatives that we're expanding from beyond the rare purple modernization project to the rest of our capital program. Um, those initiatives are specifically focused on exactly the goals that you, you mentioned. One, providing additional workforce opportunities for people in, in low income, uh, minority and disenfranchised communities. And two, creating more opportunities for small businesses and DBEs 
to do business with CTA. Um, obviously, with more federal dollars coming into the pipeline, that will allow me to fund more capital projects, which will allow me to use those programs in a broader range of projects than I currently have in place in my capital program. Uh, and so we continue, we want to continue to support those initiatives. I think CTA is well positioned to, to maximize the benefits of those initiatives as part of our um, expanded capital program. And we've already seen tremendous results in that area um, from what we've done with the Red Program Modernization Project. Uh, and I expect that that will continue um, even more uh, as we go forward. The other thing that that's worth mentioning is that one of the things that that was also um, a part of the infrastructure bill was a a the ability to use uh, local hiring uh, commitments as part of a, as part of capital projects. That is something that I have been advocating for at the federal level for a number of years, and we know from previous experience when they had these type of initiatives as a pilot that it allows me to specifically create and targeted hiring opportunities for low income and minority communities. And I, I expect to take a tremendous advantage of that flexibility on future projects as we move forward. Thank you. And, and to add to that question, and I love your answer, do you currently have a mentor protege program uh, to, to help assist smaller business get to the top? Yes. We do have a mentor protege program. We also, we also have structured our procurements in such a way that we that we create tiered opportunities, particularly in our professional services contracts. So, uh, for projects under a certain dollar threshold, we create subcategories of, of of contractors to 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 pursue and apply for those jobs, as opposed to what we view as major capital projects, which have a much higher threshold. Uh, those those the visions that we created are intended to not only provide opportunities for small businesses, but to allow businesses to grow over time, to move from one threshold to another, and not put themselves in a position where they're overcommitted uh, at a very early stage in their development, or with projects that they probably are not in a position to financially support um, uh, and complete. So we've put a lot of things in place structurally in the way we handle our procurements and in the way that we manage our projects to develop and grow DBEs and SBEs. And we continue and want to continue to grow that as we move forward. Thank you for your commitment and passion on that subject matter. I heard a little bit of your plan about maintenance and general improvement, but considering the climate today, safety and security for the riders is of a major concern. What are you taking? What what are you doing to to enhance uh, safety and security on your buses? We have added additional funding in our budget to in, to increase our security presence uh, on CTA. Um, as you know, we work closely with the Chicago Police Department to provide security and police services to to the agency as a whole. Um, the the city has also made commitments to expand and, and improve upon the presence of the police on CTA, uh, in addition to our unarmed security guard services, as well as a number of other initiatives that we talked about around Refresh and Renew, which are intended to upgrade our, our, our stations and, and bus turnarounds, uh, provide better lighting, uh, improve the camera uh, uh, oversight, and provide a, a, a safer environment uh, for our customers and for our employees. Uh, it is a concern that we we feel the same as you do, uh, and we're you know we're working as as best as we can to address that, uh, along with working with our partners in the police department, both in Chicago. And I should point out, we have similar similar relationships with the suburban police departments uh, for those stations and, and facilities that reside outside the city of Chicago. Thank you, thank you. Um, my last question, um, as for your presentation, sixty percent ridership is there, um, which leads me to another question. Um, there's a lot of new compliances and guidelines, obviously due to COVID-19, vaccinations, et cetera. Are your employees required to be OSHA certified at this time? Sorry, are they required to be what? OSHA certified. For, for, for positions that require that certification, they are. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, all of our employees are not OSHA certified. Many of the positions don't require an OSHA certification. Um, uh, but for those where that where that is a, a requirement for the position, yes, they go through the appropriate training and get the appropriate certifications. Got it. And 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 as we see things uh, clearing up, considering the climate today of hiring labor shortage, what is your employee retention and hiring plans to meet the demand? We move forward. Well, you 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 have hit on a on a a challenge that I think just about every business is facing these days, and CTA is no exception to that. Um, uh, you know, we have we have ramped up our recruitment, um, particularly for entry level positions at CTA. Um, uh, we're looking to to you know expand and obviously address the shortages that we have in our own workforce. Um, as we as many of our our you know, colleagues have, have dealt with during the pandemic. We have seen an exodus of a number of employees who basically are making different decisions about what they want to do going forward. Uh, and we're working to address that. But I, I will admit that it is very much a work in progress uh, and something that we're going to continue to be addressing diligently over the course of the following year. Thank you. So I want to commend you and your staff during these last. Uh, uh, by all times, you've done an amazing job. And thank you, sir, for answering my question. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. Other questions, uh, Mr. Secretary? You see? Director Carey Carrie has raised. Director Carey. Yes. Mr. Director Carey, good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to thank CTA for a, a very comprehensive presentation. Um, I have two questions. One relates to the electrification of the buses and um, a couple different points. I think I heard that you're ordering 600 standard buses, which I assume is diesel and 70, 70 electric buses. Um, so right. what, are, what are the barriers to ordering more electric and fewer diesel? And could your plans um, I assume they might have something to do with infrastructure, the electric uh, charging. Um, could your plans change in the light of the infrastructure bill and the new funding that might be available for creating the infrastructure? And lastly, relating to electrification, is there an opportunity for CTA and PACE to work together um, as they're both moving to electrif electrifying the buses? Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, with regards to the first question, uh, you're absolutely right. The barriers that we face to purchasing, you know, um, more electric buses are are multiple. One of which is the infrastructure that we need to actually operate them. Um, uh, as you know, many of our garages are well over sixty years old. Uh, they do not have the capability right now to to handle an electric bus fleet, and we have to build that out. Um, in addition to that, you know, our buses our buses because we operate twenty four hours a day, seven days a week tend to operate over 100 miles a day throughout the entire city. And so having a, a grid of, of charging stations uh, and, and, and other infrastructure in place is a critical component to the successful implementation of a charging system. Uh, the third point that I would make, quite honestly, is the capacity of the manufacturing industry to provide buses. Um, CTA, CTA has a bus fleet of over 1,800 buses. Um, from, from the conversation that I've had with bus manufacturers right now, their ability to fill orders for, you know, bus, you know, for, for significant, uh, bus purchases is very limited. Now, I expect that is going to grow. Uh, and I think a lot of it will happen as a result of the infrastructure bill and other, uh, measures that are being put in place. Uh, and to, in response to your second question. Uh, I have always viewed the 2040 date as the floor, not the ceiling. And if the opportunities arise for me to to expand and accelerate um, our implementation of, of an all electric fleet, uh, we will do that. Uh, the, the other piece that I would tell you is that by the end of this year, we are going to have finished a plan that is going to lay out strategically all the things that we need to do to get to 100% accessible fleet within the 2040 timeframe. Uh, and that is really coordinating both the acquisition of buses, the build out of the infrastructure, 
the upgrades of, uh, to our stations and facilities that will allow us to basically support the buses that we, that we need to purchase. And then finally, with regards to coordination with PACE, yes, we are, we are working with and coordinating with PACE, particularly around the charging infrastructure that we're talking about putting in place throughout the city. Um, obviously, there are a number of locations where both PACE and CGA intersect in terms of service that we provide, and I think there will be opportunities for us to coordinate on, on sharing and building out infrastructure that will allow us to benefit from the charging stations that we'll need to operate both, you know, PACE's fleet as well as CJA's fleet uh, as we continue to expand our footprint throughout the entire service area. Okay, uh, thank you very much, President Carter. I look forward to seeing the report you're talking about by the end of the year, um, the end of next year. Um, one other question related to uh, the idea of issue, the proposal to issue debt. Um, is there an opportunity for you to postpone that or perhaps not need to do it given the new infrastructure bill? That's an interesting question. And I think to some degree, it is gonna depend on what the state decides to do in terms of taking advantage of the infrastructure bill. As, as uh, Executive Director Redden pointed out, there is a significant, a historic amount of funding that's gonna be available in this infrastructure bill. Unfortunately, very little of it is 100%, you know, federally funded. We still are gonna need a non-federal match to basically access those funds. Uh, and I think that, you know, in addition to the formula money that that the the uh, that Leanne Redden pointed out to you, there's going to be a lot of discretionary uh, funds out there as well. And so, um, you know, I'm always looking for ways to avoid issuing debt uh, if I can. But I also recognize that with a 13 billion dollar, you know, state of good repair need, uh, I have to continue to find innovative ways to address uh, our ongoing needs going forward. And some of that has been helped by the state legislature. Things like allowing me to, um, to leverage uh, tax increment financing um, uh, funds to support major capital investments like RPM and the red line extension are gonna certainly impact that conversation. But at the end of the day, I think we're gonna have to continue to have a conversation about what are we gonna do to get to a state of good repair uh, while also, as, as we discussed, in a post-pandemic world, having the, the funding and the resources to innovate and, and address the flexibility that I think we're going to need to deal with whatever the new normal is. Uh, so while I would, I would optimistically hope that I wouldn't have to do that, I, I really can't guarantee that that'll be the case. Okay. Th thank you for your answer. Mr. Chairman, Director Lewis has a raised hand. All right, Michael, thank you, Pat, for your questions, by the way. Right, thank you. Us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and good morning, uh, President Carter. Uh, first of all, yeah. excellent presentation and excellent uh, budget review by the CTA and the other service agencies. Uh, I had a couple of questions initially, and then the third one was prompted by a response that you gave. So let me th start with the one that was prompted. Uh, workforce acquisition has been a challenge for most major organizations. The CTA had a very innovative program of hiring uh, the recently incarcerated as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, functionally disabled. I wondered if that program was continuing and whether or not, particularly in this uh, workforce environment, if that's something that you're going to put more emphasis on. The answer to the question is yes, the program is continuing. Um, you know, I would very much like to be able to expand that program, and we're we're in discussions with the unions right now about the ability to do that. But I have viewed our second chance program, which is the program that you're referring to, as one of the cornerstone um, uh, programs for the type of equity um, support that we can give to to members of the community who are in need of and looking for stable, good-paying jobs. Uh, and I think it will continue to be as it has in the past. A, a strong pipeline of potential uh, people to fill the vacancies that we have here at CTA. Yeah, terrific, I'm encouraged by that. Um, I have a question and then kind of a statement that somewhat piggybacks on Director Andalcio's question. So, uh, and, and just uh, uh, in the spirit of our former director, um, Ike um, Margalis, I'm gonna ask this of all three service agencies, but the question is um, relative to the last mile program, 
in prior presentations, we talked about that as a key success factor in making sure that um, the, the ridership levels were maintained uh, by executing on that last mile program aggressively. I heard some reference to it, but wanted to circle back uh, to determine if that's another area of focus because a lot of riders are saying, gosh, I've got to get from point A to point B, and if you drop me off at point B and a half, that's not good enough. So could you illuminate that just a bit? Sure. I mean, I, obviously, CTA, um, from my perspective, is blessed with one of the most robust uh, bus systems in the in the country. Um, having said that, uh, we ha we are in the middle of undertaking right now a bus vision study that's intended to take a holistic look at our entire bus system and see where and how we need to adjust it to meet the travel needs of the communities that we serve. Uh, it's my expectation that out of that study, which will have a significant public participation input process as part of it, uh, we're going to get the kind of feedback that you're talking about in terms of challenges or barriers uh, to that first mile, last mile uh, situation. And we will be then developing a plan that would allow us to ultimately address that in terms of either modifying our existing service or looking at what other options may be available to do that. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, CTA's grid system puts bus service in, in, in range of just about everyone in our service area uh, in far less than a mile. But we also coordinate with the city on, our, on their bike sharing program. Uh, we also obviously look to expand our rail system to address other inequities that we know exist in terms of the time travel uh, that's involved in, in, in riding our system in certain parts of the city, uh, while continuing to look at innovative ideas uh, going forward that may incorporate uh, other types of transportation options that easily tie into and support um, uh, other options like uh, bike share and ride share and everything else. Um, one of the things that we've been really focused on is, is developing and promoting our Ventra app and putting on our app the ability to seamlessly connect yourself to, say, Divi Bike, uh, and to be able to use that as a way to both connect you to CTA and also take care of that last portion of the trip um, from our station or bus stop to, to the location that you're trying to get to. And we want to expand on that even more. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. One of the reasons why I'm very excited about my new Department of Innovation is that that's the area where we really work to develop the technology to support that. Uh, and I think that in combination with our review of our entire bus system is going to provide a, a future CTA system that is going to be much more uh, responsive to and much more capable of addressing the needs of the riding community as we move forward. Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, one last comment, and uh, this is um, both a, a partial question and a partial statement, kind of piggybacking what Director Andasio talked about and you kind of alluded to. Um, but diversity and inclusion continue to be a very key metric for most high performing organizations. While we measure supplier diversity performance measures, uh, what commitments have or are being made to consider this issue at the staff, leadership and governance levels, fully understanding that uh, the service agencies do not control all aspects of this process? No, I think that's a, a fair comment slash question. Um, uh, I, too, am, am firmly committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, at CTA. It is integrated into our performance measures, um, performance evaluations of our management team and our employees. Uh, but it also does go into our contracting relationships, our external relationships, and the other things that we do as an organization. And one of the reasons why I've created an, a, a new office of equity and inclusivity is because I want to create a renewed focus on those efforts um, uh, to better coordinate them, to amplify them, to give them visibility within our organization, and to really ensure that we are maximizing the, the opportunities that we have to address those challenges, both internally within CTA, but also externally in the way that we interact with our community that we serve. Okay. Thank you, President Carter. Um, those are my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Director Lewis. Other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Sorry. Director Colson has a raised hand. Yes, Director Colson, good morning. Well, good morning all. I have a question on the uh, the proposed new bond issuance. As I read it, um, 
one of the terms would be that there's no principal payments for 22 years. Um, is that inviting big trouble down the road? I mean, are there any plans? What are you going to do in 22 years when the principal becomes due? And is that really, in, in view of the uh, the federal infrastructure bill, is that really a necessary term of the uh, proposed bond issuance? You know, I'm going to let Jeremy Fine, my CFO, respond to that question specifically. I, I, I wish I could be the type of financial expert on all the details of our debt issuance as, as uh, Jeremy is. But uh, Jeremy, do you want to take that question? Absolutely, um, Director Colson. Uh, it's a wraparound structure. Uh, you know, in essence, we're looking at the total bond portfolio in total, uh, not on a on a on a deal by deal type basis. Uh, we're looking at what the overall debt service would be uh, for the agency, uh, and again, that that style or that um, you know amortization schedule kind of layers in uh, that new bond deal. Uh, into the overall portfolio so that our debt service in total uh, remains relatively the same. Uh, so again, that's kind of the, the wraparound structure uh, that you indicated and that's the rationale for it. Okay, thanks. And I, I hope you would reconsider issuing any debt at all uh, in view of the federal infrastructure. And I assume that's an option still on the table. Yes, Director Colson, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I would love to be in a position not to issue debt and I know uh, you would, you as well as the rest of the RTA board would support uh, going back down to Springfield and getting the type of, of money that we need to take advantage of the infrastructure bill and to put us in a position where where CTA doesn't or RTA for that matter because I know you issued debt as well uh, wouldn't have to issue debt because there's adequate state funding to allow us to match and take advantage of the investment opportunities going forward. So yes, if I if 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 I can find other alternatives other than the issue of debt, I would certainly pursue them. Okay, but we're going to get some federal infrastructure money, right? We know we don't know how much. We are, but, but as I indicated, the federal infrastructure money still requires a non-federal match. It's not one hundred percent, and so I still need to figure out where that non-federal match comes from. I will say this: clearly, having more federal uh, money can spread out whatever debt I might need to issue to cover a whole lot more activity. Um, as opposed to what I might have had to do without that money, where I would have to fund at a significant level certain projects for which I had no federal money to invest uh, or no state or local money to invest. Um, so, you know, certainly we need to look at what our strategy will look like in light of um, the additional uh, uh, federal funding that's coming to us. But I also want to be competitive for the discretionary programs that will be out there that will also be significant in terms of additional funding that we could get for the region. Uh, and I need to figure out how to how to maximize all of that with the you know non-federal resources that we have available to us. And if there are other resources I can use, I will use them. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Director Colson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Director Gadding has a raised hand. Yes, Director Gadding. Um, thank you, and thanks for the presentation. I'm curious about um, ways that the CTA has discussed trying to increase ridership, and if it does not increase as expected, have you started thinking about um, expense cutting or service reductions that you may need to do in the coming years? Uh, I don't anticipate having to do any expense reduction or service cuts in the coming year, primarily because of the federal funding that we've received that basically is allowing us to balance our budget. But in response to, to your question, one of the big initiatives that we were pursuing, a portion of which is being funded by the ICE funds that RTA has given us is our uh, We're Ready When You're Ready campaign, which is a marketing campaign that we put in place to actually try to encourage ridership and, and, and engage um, uh, the, the, the customer base in a positive way towards coming back to public transportation. The other thing that we've been doing is working very closely with the city of Chicago and the efforts that they've undertaken to to reopen the city uh, and to start to encourage you know um, people to to utilize and engage in activities throughout the city. And in one of the areas that we've seen the greatest growth in ridership, it has been around social events as opposed to business commuter events. So things like White Sox and Cubs games. We're actually at our pre pandemic levels in terms of ridership. Um, uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth there. And then finally, 
of uh, the whole philosophy behind our our fair restructuring and, and and our focus on on our passes is intended to do exactly that to increase ridership and 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 to bring people back onto CTA. Um, obviously, in the long term, if we don't get ridership growth back to the level that we need for it to be, then we're going to have some difficult conversations that we're going to have to have. Uh, but I don't foresee that happening in the immediate future. And right now, I'm really focused on doing everything that I can to increase that ridership so we can avoid the possibility of facing service cuts or, or other um, cost increases that, that would be detrimental to the service and to our customers. Mr. Chairman, I see no additional hands at this time. Okay. On once going twice. Um, Dorval and, and Jeremy and Michelle, thank you again. Um, you know, far be it from me to say this, but obviously, uh, you know, I agree with Director Colson. Watch your debt. Easier said than done. Um, and uh, last but not least, you know, with fuel prices, and you've done a magnificent job. On, on getting us through the current increase in, in fuel prices, but you know, negotiate your fuel prices in the future as carefully as you've done them now, because uh, you're in, in a good position, Dorval, as fuel prices, you know, are are skyrocketing for the for the current time. But uh, thank you, uh, we thank you for your your discussions over the last uh, two and a half weeks uh, with the other service boards and. Uh, our staff and uh, Director Carey and others uh, on our board, uh, Director uh, uh, Melvin, uh, but always appreciate uh, your openness and uh, um, you know keep up your great work under immensely stressful uh, and difficult times. Uh, and again, um, Dorval, congratulations on your APTO award. I've always said I believe you are the best operator uh, in the United States and. Uh, you know, as we discuss COVID, which has been you know, the the immense uh, focal point that we've all been under the last 18 months of all the systems in the United States, APTA said that you and the CTA employees and you have magnificent employees um, from top to bottom uh, handled the, the 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 COVID crisis um, as well or better than than any transit agency in America. So. My hats off to you and uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time always. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate as always the support of the board and and you know I look forward to working with you all in a collaborative manner to continue to get the funding that we need to keep the region's transit system strong and and moving forward uh, in a in a positive direction. Great. Thank you very much. All right. With that, let's let's move on to. Uh, to Metra and Jim Derwinski and um, the Metra. Good morning, Mr. Choice. Chairman, members Hi, of the board. Uh, you hear me fine, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Good morning and members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here today. I thank you for the opportunity to present Metra's budget as we're still in obviously very tenuous times. Uh, along with me today here is Alan Ochab, our acting chief financial officer, and Lynette Civil Rep. Ru Civarella, our senior division director of uh, capital planning. You know, we have a very similar story, but yet also a very different story to CTA. So I'd like to take and walk the board through those um, those highlights. Can next slide. So for our 2022 budget, we're looking at a $900 million operating budget. This includes no fare increase. Um, we're going to fund the restoration of pre-pandemic service levels. I'll talk more about the reasons behind that and what that's going to entail. We're going to assume that ridership this year is going to start around 25% and grow about 10% through the year. And we'll talk about that. We still are going to have to be using $295 million of federal relief to cover the loss of fair revenue. We do meet the re uh, recovery ratio using the federal relief money. And of course, we're doing everything promoting equity and diversity. Our capital program is just over just over 260 million pre the uh, law that got signed into um, act this uh, Monday. So we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. 
For operating expenses, uh, operations and maintenance is 690 million, admin 123. These are just regular 3% escalations from our 2019 numbers. Diesel fuel and our MED electricity is 53 million. Claims and insurance uh, sitting at about 32 million to bring us up to the 900 million. Um, you've talked about a lot of the board members have talked about fuel and, and certainly oil prices have been shifting. Fuel prices have been shifting. Metro currently has a lock, a budgeted lock uh, for 2022 and 2023. We took advantage of when the price of oil uh, uh, crashed down to the bottom to work with our vendors. In that, we didn't lock 100% of the fuel. Uh, we have about a 70% lock of the fuel that we plan on using everything else comes off the spot market but in the, from a budgetary standpoint for the next two years we look pretty good on diesel fuel on uh, electricity we've been receiving fairly good um uh, weight of uh, rates with uh com ed on our metro electric and we're, we're pleased with the numbers we see there next slide please our revenues as i discussed uh Fair revenues and other revenues will come in around 146. Sales tax is uh, obviously very significant and improved at uh, 458. And once again, the federal relief money that balances this budget is uh, right around 295. Next slide. This slide here uh, demonstrates what Metro has seen over the last um, 18, 20 months of the pandemic. You can clearly see that our ridership, which obviously drives our revenue and it also drives our expense since we reduced service at the beginning of the pandemic, completely crashed. What you would see before that, our numbers so high they wouldn't fit on this chart. So with that said, when the pandemic hit, we did reduce down to 50%. We did maintain service on all 11 lines. Currently today, we're at about 80% service. Uh, we plan on moving back to 100% of service. It's interesting to take a look at at least this ridership slide and you can see clearly where the uh, COVID uh, kickbacks have occurred, where certain surges have occurred just based on the ridership dips. We had an expectation right around um, Labor Day that we were gonna see a significant increase in ridership. And that was based on our conversations with the Central Business District owners about what they were gonna have their employees start doing. Um, that got hit with the Delta variant and we actually saw a dip in September. So right about that time, rather than having another increase of service level, we actually maintained service level prior to that. That one little peak that you see there, and this is interesting after uh, President Carter's presentation, that, that peak you see there, that's Lollapalooza. So that's people saying, hey, I wanna get out, I wanna do something, I'm not going to work, but I'll ride public transportation. And we do see our weekend riderships return to some days as high as 60%, but it's been averaging around 50%, which is far better than what we've been seeing during the weekday rider. What we do see here is a new ridership pattern. Mondays and Fridays tend to be 10 to 20% lower than Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And what we see is the average seat on a Metro train right now is picked up by two, three, or four people during the week, not the standard monthly pass holder. Monthly passes are way down. And we've actually introduced uh, other fair products that have taken over basically the, our, our number one sales channel. This January, uh, we do plan on introducing new service, um, more enhanced service. And, and it's gonna help us, um, once again, what our passengers are telling us, more frequent service, uh, not having a train every two hours. And I'll talk a little bit about some of our pilots here. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So service restoration principles, we've been working on this for two years, continually modifying it as we talk to our peer agencies across the country, certainly uh, what we are hearing from the business community here in Chicago. So providing constant and frequent service throughout the day with easily understandable, memorable service patterns. What does that look like? Well, that, that looks like what the current UP North schedule is half hour service or less during the rush hour peak periods, hourly service all the way to Waukegan the rest of the day. Now, once in a while in there, we're gonna have to have a small gap for maintenance windows because obviously on the, on the track, we actually still have to do maintenance windows and it's not like we can just turn the, turn the corner. We also piloted this on the BNSF, the Rock Island and the Metro Electric. And overall, the response to this more frequent service has been very positive. The trade-off to sometimes having more frequent service is a slight reduction of those express trains that people really like. So as we go through this, this is something we learned from New York. In New York, prior to the pandemic, 
uh, Metro North Railroad saw 52% of their ridership not going to Manhattan because of the fact that they increased service levels to the point where people basically use Metro North instead of using an automobile when they're moving suburb to suburb or even into the edge of the city, but not necessarily not down to the central business district. We are putting in a new express service when possible. We're continually trying to work. Obviously, a lot of the tracks that Metro operates on, if Metro doesn't own and Metro doesn't dispatch. And so putting an express train in there requires basically an open lane. It's got to have a complete shot. It can't follow a local train. It can't have a freight train. It can't have cross traffic from other, other freight trains or other even Metro trains. So that's a very interesting situation that we have to do with partnerships and, and continue to talk with those uh, freight partners who right now are actually seeing very good times. Uh, the, the markets that they're seeing are moving a lot of freight right now. And so that's a, it's something that, that we have to take into consideration when building schedules. If you build a schedule that has an express train in it that never makes it uh, to where it needs to be most of the time, well, that's something that passengers are not gonna look for. Consider transfers both with Metra um, and our other two service providers. I'll talk a little bit about where we're at on one of those. But that's still been an impediment. Um, we clearly believe that from a regional perspective, uh, transfers from one uh, form of transportation to another form of transportation are exactly what passengers are looking for. We're gonna explore further more reverse commute. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had we had piloted something up in the uh, Lake Cook region uh, with Abbey, Abbott and the pharmaceutical area. And it was actually very productive. We we set standards uh, that we had to have certain growth. We exceeded that growth. Actually, we beat the growth by one whole year. We said it needed two years to reach the growth levels. We actually hit those growth levels in one year. And then unfortunately, the pandemic hit. The other things we're doing, and we did in 2020 and 2021, was this $10 all day pass to make it more convenient and flexible for people to come to the system, utilize the system. Now that pass also allows you to move from line to line to line. Which, which ultimately means downtown here, you have to actually go walk from one station to the other station. But once you have that $10 all day pass, you can use it all over the place. What we found with the $10 all day pass is it wasn't really an option for people with three zones or less. At three zones or less, it was just more economical for people to buy the one-way ticket or a round trip ticket. So what we're gonna introduce this year is a $6 all day pass that actually is targeting those people operating on this or using the system three zones or less, not necessarily just the city because we do have suburb to suburb people that are only going a few zones. Once again, just like uh, the CTA, these uh, initiatives are to try to bring people back to the system and to start using the system more regularly. And we're gonna, when promoting regional equity, I'd like to talk a little bit here about the Fair Transit South Cook pilot project. Next slide, please. So in partnership with Cook County, Metra, and Pace on July, or excuse me, January 1st, very cold day, uh, we actually kicked this thing off. And so what does this thing do? Well, it's got three very clear principles. Reduction of fares, frequency of service, and then transferability between modes. So we were able to do the first one very easily. The fare product that we offered with Fair Transit South Cook on Metra is our reduced fare fair product that existed prior to the pandemic. It's roughly 50%. So on, on the two lines that the Fair Transit South Cook pilot is operating on the Metro Electric and on the Rock Island, there's, they still have the old fare tables and it's still better to take a half price fare than even use the $10 or $6 fare product. So reduction of price is the first key component, frequency of service. On July 12th this year is when we added those two new pilots to so the Rock Island and the Metro Electric along with those other two lines. So with more frequent service, more, re, more reliable uh, means of getting to and from, giving more flexibility, that's one of the key components of Fair Transit South Cook. And then transferability, we continue to work on this. This is, this is very challenging. As Metro has traditionally been a distance based like all commuter in the country and CTA and PACE are more time-based, we're still working together to try to figure out a way to make the transferability a reality. One of the big things that happened this year and CTA owns the contract is we actually uploaded into a new service provider with regard to the Venture app and Metra's apps. Um, with that, um, that service provider has um, New York and Boston as well and resources uh, have been limited to try to really um, get that thing to where we all want it to be. And I know we continue to talk about financially how that impacts all of us. 
So how is the Fair Transit South Cook doing? I guess the way to look at it is to look at the other lines. Right now, Metro Electric and Rock Island districts are running between seven and 10% higher ridership compared to the, all the other lines. So they have a higher lift of pre-pandemic ridership numbers and it's on a consistent basis. One of our lines, um, the actual Metro Electric South Chicago branch is running some days as high as 70 or 80% of pre-pandemic levels. So we believe that at least right now, some of this is actually taking great effect. Next slide, please. So our 2022 to 2026 capital program, the highlights are rolling stock. Uh, we still are running those Eisenhower cars uh, out there on the BNSF. Our bridges haven't gotten any younger. As I reported last year, we have over 400 bridges that are over a century old. Our signal system and communication systems actually are getting more upgraded on a normal basis to make us more efficient and reliable. Stations we'll talk a lot about here in support activities really is this project management oversight that we brought on. Next slide, please. So first is uh, rolling stock. So in January, our board uh, awarded uh, a contract to Alstom USA to build Metra modern passenger cars. This is a rendering. The cars are going to be built in New York at their Hornell facility. They're actually building a brand new facility there just to build these cars. And um, it's been moving along very well. Um, we've been meeting with Alstom on a regular basis, starting to look at some of the details, and they've actually started laying out the framework to, to start the, the first kind of car shells. Now, this process of building brand new rail cars that have never been out before is going to take time. We don't anticipate the first cars hitting the system until late in 2024. But hopefully here, uh, they're telling us in 2022, we'll actually start seeing some of the actual work uh, getting done. We work with our unions and we're, we've been listening to the passengers. We're gonna be doing a lot of demonstrations about amenities inside the cars to kind of figure out what passengers want. We recently were down at APTA talking to the manufacturers and even looking inside a lot of the buses to see what the accruements are that passengers uh, have as options, even if we put those, you know, say bus things into a rail car. We, we've listen to our passengers. We've listened to our passengers about what they didn't like about the old car and their concerns about the new cars. And we believe we're going to have a really big winner here. We've fund, we're funding at this point in time, a base order of 200 cars. And um, with that, we, we have it open to 500 cars to purchase. Depending where ridership goes in the future, these cars will actually replace those 1950s to 1980 cars. So at that point in time, we're probably talking about replacing cars well over 40 years old, all the way over 70 years old. Inside these cars, they're modern. They're actually almost a three level car. As you step into the car, rather than have your ADA lift, have to lift almost five feet in the air. It's only lifting now 18 inches. Above the two trucks where the wheels sit, there's another level. And then up on top, there's a wide open level. Um, they're gonna have the latest enhancements and air filtration all the uh, latest enhancements in LED lighting and efficiency and anything we can do to actually make it so that it's very user-friendly, including in-window potentially uh, video systems that are informational. On our locomotives, um, as, as pointed out, I mean, there's, there's a strive to go towards zero emissions, but anytime you can reduce your emissions footprint, you're doing a good thing. And so in 2019, Metra, uh, purchased 15 remanufactured tier three locomotives. These are X freight locomotives. They have not hit the property yet. We anticipate them coming mid 2022, but taking a locomotive that's currently running in service today at tier zero or tier one and moving it to tier three, you're moving 60 to 70% emissions reduction. So it's a significant number. Metro actually has uh, three tier three locomotives on property that we got back this summer, F-59s, a different style of locomotive. But as we test these um, 15 locomotives, we'll see where the battery technology is at comparative to the uh, additional um, purchase of up to 27 more of these uh, locomotives. The one thing that these locomotives do provide us is AC traction. I've touched on that in the past in some presentations. Long story short, it's just so much, so much more reliable than the current uh, traction that's out there providing traction underneath the locomotive. We continue our car and locomotive rehabilitation, and I always invite this board if you ever want to come out and see uh, the work we do with our proud union workforce inside of our facilities. 
uh, as we rebuild uh, cars and locomotives, um, we continue that work. We're, we're doing about eight to 10 locomotives a year, and now we're up to about 55 cars a year. We're turning a car out in about 20 days, 20 days from the point it comes off the road, passengers are sitting in it, 21 days later, it's ready to go back in service. It is an operation that is, is in some respects, still to even me, it's, it's, uh, it's an awesome accomplishment. On, uh, on the front of zero emissions, we put out an RFP earlier this summer for battery powered locomotives. And so what we asked for was a conversion kit. So what you see there in that green picture there is basically one of our older locomotives. It can be anywhere. You can put an age on it from 1977 to 1992, because that's what we have. And we're gonna gut the diesel machinery out of it. And we're gonna put batteries in that. We're gonna buy kits, batteries underneath where the fuel tank used to be. And then basically inverters will run the entire uh, system as it would going down the track. The interesting thing is timing, right? There's been other battery locomotives that have been out there. Lead acid battery locomotives that didn't work that well, failed immensely. Then you had nickel cadmium batteries out there. It's really these lithium batteries that have taken everything to the next level. And that's why you're starting to see them more and more adapted into the buses. So we've been working with some of the manufacturers and they've developed a few prototypes out there for freight in the United States. And so we felt it was the right time to get out into the industry after soliciting the industry, if they could produce something and try to develop a, the, met, the first commuter passenger locomotive in the country. And so we are gonna also be partnering with a few other commuter agencies if this program can take off. And this may just be the pilot. There may be other future ones that come from this, but this is actually putting, you know, the steel where the rubber meets the road. Here we have to have the steel meet the rail. And this is actually getting something out there that we can take a look at, reduce the emissions footprint and learn from this so that we can make uh, very good decisions in the future. This last month, our board gave us permission to put out an RFP for battery powered train sets. What does that look like? Well, it doesn't look like anything you see on the page here. It kind of looks like those airport shuttles you might see at some other major cities. So they're, they're single level train sets. They, they're gonna be designed um, to go on our branch lines, our Rock Island branch, our Fox Lake branch, maybe up to Kenosha, maybe up to Harvard. Areas where we just don't have a lot of people on the train for a good portion of the day, it doesn't make sense to drag around a nine car train with a diesel locomotive, when from an operating perspective, cost perspective and emissions perspective, we can operate something at a much smaller, more affordable level with obviously a zero emissions footprint. Taking that step here and developing that to get that FRA compliant to the United States is gonna be a big leap. It's also what we look forward to someday if we ever were able to enhance our service to O'Hare, some, something like that, those type of train sets would be what we'd be looking to operate there. Next slide, please. So before I get into all the other parts of the uh, physical infrastructure, I did touch earlier on, we did some reorganizations within the last year. And the biggest thing we did was bring in a project management oversight. Uh, WSP is our uh, PMO and we created Department of Capital Delivery. Now Department of Capital Delivery is now merging with our uh, government affairs, government relations departments, as well as our marketing and media departments. The synergies that exist when you get all of the people talking with all the stakeholders about what happens in their community is something that I've identified is something that we've missed the boat on in the past, but now we're going to be heading in the right direction. Our PMO is also tasked to provide us with a mentor protege program, which they did develop and is sitting at the FTA right now for approval. The, this reorganization, once again, allows us to be reaching out to the communities. Metra has 242 stations. We serve like 179 communities directly, plus all the indirect ones that actually work with us. So we have a, a very large footprint, very large audience. The way we've uh, decided to um, use the capital dollars is through the investment priorities set through by the RTA and by Metra strategic plans. Next slide, please. Or excuse me, back right there. I just wanted to touch back, if you go back one, I forgot. We Just to touch on the bridges. So some of the bridge work that we're doing, because we do have uh, so many bridges old, um, the bridge A110, um, that one there is on Milwaukee District North Line, um, A313, um, another bridge uh, near Roundout over the Chicago River. Anytime you go over river, these are complicated. And then in Gresham and, and another one on the, um, 
electric district where, I mean, excuse me, the um, Auburn Park Station on the Rock Island District that we have to uh, repair as well. This is a very small portion of bridges. What the PMO has allowed us to do is really take a look at the next few years and really start accelerating our bridge program. Now I can go to the next slide. Thank you. 75th Street Corridor Improvement Project are also known as the 75th Street SIP. Uh, one of the bridges we are having to lift. So sometimes you don't have to just replace a bridge. Sometimes you have to lift the bridge because when the bridges were put in, other railroads go underneath us. In this particular case, we have to lift the bridge as part of the CREATE program to allow freight traffic with double stacks to be able to go underneath us. So this work's going to be starting here in the spring. Along with the CREATE uh, program, and you see the 70 Street a portion of the 75th Street SIP there, where all these railroads come together, a portion of this is also designing for the Southwest service trains, a connector over to the Rock Island District. Uh, we call it the P2 project. It's a huge engineering flyover. It's not funded, but we are actually funding and, and working on the design. Next slide, please. Stations and parking, I, I touched on Auburn Park so that the picture on the left, that's a rendering of the Auburn Park Station. The board awarded a contract earlier this fall to uh, Auburn Park. We're working with IDOT to get the notice to proceed out. You can see by the rendering there that this is a pretty complicated station. You, what you can't really see by that rendering is the fact that the station itself is on a bridge over a railroad on a bridge over 79th Street. So 79th Street is the busiest bus corridor with CTA, and our hope is that this, along with fair transferability, makes this a major hub for transferability between Metra and CTA in the future. Just north on that picture is that 78th Street bridge that has to be completely rebuilt as it's 120 years old, and it also is going to have an elevator shaft in there as part of this entire station project. So the station project is going to be in two major phases. The one on the right, Peterson Ridge, we did a groundbreaking on uh, about a month ago. So that one started, the pile driving's uh, been going in. This is an area that actually is another place that had a station many, many, many years ago as uh, old freight railroads that used to operate the system took out. Same thing with Auburn Park. There used to be a station at, at uh, 78th Street back in the 1960s. So we're starting to put back in the infrastructure that our legacy freight partners before Metro was even created took out. Next slide, please. So other planned station work this month, we, our board passed uh, um, the 147th Street uh, station improvements. So that thing's gonna be at, there at Sibley and Harvey. And it's um, a modern station taken in consideration, modern lighting, cameras, inviting, open, safety, security, kissing rides and redoing the parking lot. And of course the, uh, the entrances as most of the Metro electric stations are on raised elevation and it's it's uh you have to go through a staircase we're gonna have obviously make this ada compliant one that we improved uh, the month before was our um station at blue island and you can see this list here so when it says in two years that means the designs are going to be done and we hope to be awarding contracts for construction in two years the others in the five-year plan those designs will be starting within the next couple of years Metro itself has 242 stations with the two new ones at Auburn Park and Peterson Ridge, we're gonna be up to 244 stations. Of those 244 stations, Metro has 52 stations that currently are not ADA compliant. 10 of those stations are partially ADA compliant. So our continued goal to work on our accessibility and equity is to continue to do work on stations that are not accessible. And that's where our priorities are at. And if they are partially accessible, bring them up to fully accessible uh, means. We, through our capital program right now, do not have any bonds. We have no bonds planned. We have no debt. We have no bonds planned in the near term. And the exciting news coming from Washington, I think at this point in time, keeps that plan in place. We're going to continue to obviously have conversation with our board to, to determine whether or not bond issuance is something in Metro's future, but at this point in time, it does not look to be. So next slide, please. So what are we doing to bring people back? Well, along with the pilot programs, we're trying to improve the customer experience. 
So we're working on ADA uh, enhancements system-wide and shelters. Um, many of our stations absolutely don't have any shelter. You're out there in the rain. So um, not just putting up a three-sided bus shelter, we're actually looking to put in heated shelters. We have a procurement out working on that. Um, we're gonna be putting that into many of our stations that are in existence already. Signage, last month I, I showed our board um, all the new signage that's going up. CTA is so far ahead of the curve on this on us where they have signs that talk about the next train coming, safety um, and, and things of that nature as they have these digital signs. Well, Metro's now finally getting to the point where we've actually got our pilot program done with uh, st signage and we're going to be looking to be funding a complete signage um, enhancement to all of our stations, all 244 of those stations coming up along with better wayfinding. Um, and tied into that is a, a replacement of all of our onboard GPS tracking system, which ties into the signage at the station. It also down the road gives us the ability to enhance the customer experience on board the train with video screens potentially talking a little bit more about what the next station is and connectivity and, and just better information. Elevator replacement. A lot of our elevators at our elevated stations are just beyond useful life. We continue to, to put money into those things. So we put an elevator priority replacement program and over the next several years, at least 16 of those elevators are gonna be fully replaced. Parking lot improvements, looking at the way our parking lots are, are laid out, looking at how people are using the parking lots. Uh, new ticket vending machines. So uh, the board passed this month uh, the purchase of uh, ticket vending machines. Currently, we have only 45 ticket vending machines on the entire system. The board approved up to a $70 million uh, us to purchase ticket vending machines for all stations. This is going to completely change the way the rider experiences Metra. They'll be able to get their fair product, cash, credit, Venmo, you name it, whatever the new invention is, they'll be able to get that through a modern ticket vending machine at the station. Right now, today, if you send a friend over to Metra and you get on the train with your credit card, we do not have a way to take your credit card on the train. So this is gonna change the way we operate. And on the bottom there, you see a QR code. One of the things we launched when we launched our pilot programs this summer was this onboard survey. It's the first in the country. And the most interesting thing about this is, is on every single train car, about every other window mass, some of the doors have it. Most interesting about this is when someone hits that QR code and decides to respond to the survey, and we constantly change the survey up about every two to three months, we are literally hearing from a passenger on the train. And that tells us whether we're doing something good, whether we're doing something bad, whether they don't like something, whether they love something. And that, that information is so valuable. So we're making decisions based a lot on what we're hearing from our customers. We also redid um, what we used to have is called the on the buy level and you see a, a rendering there of the My Metro Magazine. It talks a lot about what Metro does. It talks about Metro's employees. And we've been trying to get more and more people, uh, partners in there to uh, work on enhancing that. Our cleaning on the train as all of the service agencies have done across the country is now world renowned. Uh, where we went to and from is incredible. I, I often tell the story about how our coach cleaners brought in their own pressure washers at night when, they, when we told them we've got to get these cars clean if we want to get people back. And basically through their initiative, we basically now have a totally new way of doing uh, the uh, the cleaning on the train, they go through an enhanced cleaning. One of the comments received through the survey all the time is, I haven't ridden Metro in a while, but my gosh, these trains are clean. I must be in a brand new car. Um, we also are piloting new air filtration for, for the, uh, uh, the air system. That's gonna use electrostatic precipitation and also UV light filtration. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. The new cars will come with that, but we're gonna retrofit that in many old cars as we can. Next slide, please. On our DB participation over the last year, we are just over 39.2 million total. Next slide. And uh, we achieved our federal goals. And inside the um, non-federal, you can see our numbers there at 14 and 16% for us. Those are very good years. One of the questions I heard earlier, so I'll just touch it now, what are we doing uh, to work with uh, DBE businesses? We've been hosting workshops virtually for a year and a half now. We have a new DBE director and she's on her own taking the opportunity to say, why are people not able to do business with Metro? So she's been hosting these virtual workshops, well attended, 
um, inviting businesses in to talk about the federal processes, to talk about metrics processes, to make sure that people are ready and able to submit applications to do work with primes and also as primes as DBEs. These workshops have been highly, highly successful. Next slide. As I wrap up today, I just wanna give a shout out to all the Metro workers. Um, just like all transit workers across the country, you know, the uncertainty that's in front of them and the uncertainty that they saw on a daily basis, that extra friction and that extra angst that they have to bring to work has always been one of my major concerns. My major concerns is because this work is unforgiving. If their head isn't in the game, if they're worried about where is that next money coming to, to balance next year's budget, that's not good. So one of the things we've done a lot of is communicate with the employees, let them know just point blank where we're at on ridership, point blank, where we're at on COVID, point blank, where are we at on the budgets? Next slide. I couldn't go without saying that one of the things we did in this last year at the end of the pandemic or at the end of 2020 was complete positive train control. It's that, it's that element that no one's ever gonna see in the background, but yet everybody pulled together to make sure this happened. Positive train control cost Metra $415 million. It was an unfunded mandate that came through and we had to basically put other things to the side with limited capital dollars as we went through the last couple of years. And currently today, it's costing us $14 million a year just to operate PTC. This is the gift that keeps giving. This is not going away. This is the gift that's gonna actually make the system safer, but it's also eventually gonna make us more efficient. When I say eventually, really um, the PTC system is gonna be derived and developed by the freight railroad. So the bigger users of it, they're the bigger ones with the contracts with the limited suppliers. And in our case, there's only one supplier that supplies most of our. Next slide, please. And one of the things, last thing with uh, with our employees here is one of the things we've done is, is launch, a, in the midst of a pandemic, yes, we launched a, a campaign called My Metro. We talked about My Metro in the past with you. My Metro is about taking personal responsibility for our riders and for each other. And our employees on a daily basis impress me about how they look out for each other, how they know that the uncertainty in front of us is, is something they have to deal with, but they have to stay safe. They have to work together. And they have to take a look at those those passengers out there as they start coming back to the system and they see the cars cleaner and they see the on-time performances there and they see the innovation and flexibility in the schedules and the new electronic signage or the people that have moved to the suburbs that have never experienced Metro and they come to Metro and they see that it's seamless and easy to use now as we start deploying more and more and more. This is what my Metro is all about. Next slide. And that's my final slide. Um, I'm happy to take any questions the, the board may have. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very, very much. Um, questions, comments from the board? Uh, Director Sager has a raised hand, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Sager, good morning. Good morning. Um, Jim, I, I want to thank you for that fine report. I want to thank uh, President uh, Carter for his fine report as well. I am continually impressed and, and frankly overwhelmed by the degree of analysis um, that you all uh, undertake on a, a daily basis. The complexity and the demand of transit today is, is just uh, surpassing, I think, all of our uh, capacity to be able to uh, take it in. But you all on a daily basis are, are reviewing schedules, you're looking at the equipment, you're looking at the fees, you're looking at the ridership, all of this analysis is incredible and I, I appreciate so much uh, what you've done there to keep us informed. I also wanna thank uh, you for the incredible responsiveness uh, and that is shown in, in flexibility that you all have undertaken uh, during this COVID period of time. And I'm, I'm just incredibly in, impressed by the uh, ability to look at things, ju not just today, but into the future. And so I truly appreciate uh, that ability to oversight. Um, I want to say that I truly enjoyed the visit 
uh, to some facilities there for rehabilitation. And I concur with you, uh, Jim, in applauding all of the uh, employees for the metro system, the union employees who are uh, so exceptionally working to really rehabilitate um, the cars and locomotives, but indeed all of the metro employees. So just an incredible uh, workers, very exceptional in terms of the dedicated efforts, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I, I do want to say just a couple of, of different types of things. Number one, uh, tongue in cheek here, but not so much tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, with all the new locomotives that you're bringing in with the purchase, which I think is great, uh, there's not one uh, named city of Woodstock yet. Uh, we'd be wonderfully pleased to accept one that is named city of Woodstock. So uh, that's my tongue in cheek. That's, that's not so much tongue in cheek. Um, Jim, the question here is that. I understand, and you reiterated today that there's a true hesitancy to extend debt. And I, I agree and understand the position of the Metro Board in that. Uh, and I am concerned about the CTA and the extent of the debt which has been placed there, uh, kind of joining um, my co colleague on the board, uh, Director Colson, and, and even the chairman. Uh, Diller, because I think the debt can be a, a true tsunami if not uh, well handled and managed. And, and I am concerned about that. But at the same time, I think that there's an opportunity to invest here, particularly as this time when we see this federal funding coming down and the uh, tremendous need that is there. And so I'm, I'm concerned that perhaps um, we need to take some advantage of some bonding opportunities to be able to get some of these significant infrastructure needs uh, taken care of. So I'd just like you to kind of address that and tell me what you think the disposition of your board would be in terms of looking at some debt uh, to take care of some infrastructure needs that exist in the metro system. Yeah, that's thank, a, you. thank you, Director. That's a great question. Um, you know, we've often talked about obviously, as President Carter brought forward, the local match. And, you know, um, Illinois did something by passing the uh, the PAYGO money that gives at least now a steady f uh, funding stream so that we can look at taking on debt service for the first time. Um, there's other streams, of course, as well, but you can't match federal for federal. And that's always been the bulk of our, our uh, income when it comes to capital. So we've talked about the fact that one of the things Metra is, it's a conglomeration of bankrupt railroads and that we had, what we've inherited is it has so much to get fixed and there's only so much you can fix at one certain period of time. You know, as much as I would love to fix 40 bridges a year, I physically can't have the railroad torn up that much because once again, once I tear up that bridge, I don't have that track. I can't run that service and there's, you know, it's the chicken and the egg thing. So you have to be very deliberate on that. Our board has talked numerous times about eventually taking on debt and debt that would make the most sense. So some of the things that are kind of on the forefront of have been somewhat acquisitions of uh, parcels of land, um, uh, specific areas of possibly freight railroads that they don't need that specific thing anymore to help control our costs in the future. Obviously some mega projects uh, have been out there. There's discussion about uh, a Fulton market project um, and that I certainly believe could benefit uh, multiple modes of, of uh, transportation. So I think in a lot of ways, our board has is, is indicated to us that they're not ready yet to open up that credit card per se, but they certainly are willing to look at it at the right time. If in fact, it's something that they feel that they really are gonna get a true return on investment, a long-term investment. Well, I certainly appreciate the response and, and I thank you so much uh, for the tremendous oversight. And I, I agree that debt is something that we have to be very cautious about. And so as a fiscal conservative, uh, I appreciate the, the, the board's hesitancy, but I, I do think that uh, debt is an important part of our economy. It's an important part of our opportunity uh, to be able to uh, get some work done. I appreciate the fact that, you know, physically, uh, it requires a lot of effort to put the schedules and to put the jigsaw puzzle together to get uh, the, the capital work and investment done. It's a huge, huge issue. 
So I appreciate that, but uh, I encourage the board to take a look at that and to see where it might best benefit the system uh, today and into the long term. So that's my comments. And again, Jim, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Mr. Chairman, Director Canty has a raised hand. Yes, Director Kenny. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Jawinski, for, for being here with us today and, and for your presentation. It's really helpful. Um, I was on the, the UP Northwest on Tuesday. I'll be on it again tomorrow. So I really appreciate the work that you guys are putting in to make sure that those trains are, are running and convenient um, and, and are, are safe to ride. So I encourage everybody to get back to their transit use if they are going to be traveling around. I actually want to touch base with you a little bit um, on a related topic and, and we can save some of it for a later conversation if we need to. Um, but there's been a lot of talk recently about some of the labor negotiations, right? And so uh, we're hearing that and, and the headline in the paper is, we have these these uh, potential strikes, maybe, um, but it won't impact ridership. And I think with people already being a little bit nervous about the train, um, are are we really on top of that? I mean, can we really say with confidence it's not going to impact service? And we are working through these with the, these concerns with the labor unions. Um, and and how are we going to move forward there? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And of course, a big concern, you know, and that's why we responded saying that there is no impact on, on the service. Railway labor is way different than any other labor. Um, it falls under the federal guidelines, of the Railway Labor Act. There's an entire process that's in place and, and we are following that process. We are working with federal mediators uh, with certain uh, parts of our unions and some of our unions we're working directly with. Um, at this point in time, we continue to be in good, productive negotiations. Uh, we clearly understand some of their concerns, and they clearly understand some of our concerns. And with that, um, we, we are, we're very hopeful that in a short period of time that we'll be able to come to some resolution with some of our labor uh, contracts. Metra has 14 labor unions on 17 different contracts, and that does not include our PSA carriers. So, to say the least, it, it's not one size fits all here, uh, but um, I, I can assure you the ability for rail labor to strike is a long way off. And the Railway Labor Act, if you want to get familiar with it, interesting reading, um, has those provisions in place because the Railway Labor Act is designed to make sure interstate commerce never stops. So, there's multiple, multiple steps in the process, and, and we are just in one of those steps. That's really helpful. So thank you for for kind of walking me through that. Um, and just as a last comment, uh, you know, I I'm always looking for us to be thinking to the future. You know, we're in a very unique point in time. So I'm glad to see that that Metra is thinking a little bit bolder, a little bit bigger bigger as they go forward um, and thinking differently about transit and how we're going to to move things forward and, and attract people back to the line. So thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Director and sorry, Mr. Chairman. Director and yes. Thank you. Um, same, uh, uh, Dorinsky. Um, I, I thank I commend you on your financial, fiscal accountability, your diligence, and your innovative, innovative leadership during this pandemic. Uh, considering the demographics again in which you serve, I was pleased to hear uh, of your DBE performance and those goals and what you're doing. And I was also glad to hear that um, uh, you adopted this new mentor protege program with WSP, and um, and I know you're working with the FTA on those guidelines. It is a good initiative, but will Metro continue funding or have the funding for that initiative? Well, I absolutely believe so. Um, that's got to be a core value. It is a core value that we have, and and it's part of the projects now. So absolutely, wonderful. And as far as employment opportunities for uh, for minorities in key leadership roles, what are your position on that, or what actions are you taking to assure? Well, I, 
So the interesting thing with with Metra and and a lot of people may or may not understand this is that uh, when we retire people, they typically are in the 30 to 50 year range. So they've been here a while. Um, it takes a while to move on. We've been working for many years and developing what I consider a great upcoming diverse bench. Um, just this week, we hired um, an African American who's been working here for 25 years as a senior uh, director to uh, oversee all the mechanical operations. And just another success story, I heard uh, that he was out in the field the other day and and just really getting some praise from his coworkers. But we continue to strive to hire. That way, we uh, we use um, a hiring firm that that has that as one of their core values to make sure that when we are hiring from the outside, that diversity inclusion is something that's a, a priority for us. Wonderful, great to hear. And uh, on labor, um, what is your employer retention and hiring plans due to this labor shortage as you increase in capacity and increase service? So there's there's three pieces to that answer. Uh, if I can, the first piece of that answer is um, a little bit right now having to do with COVID mandates um, to see what's going to happen with the workforce. Metro does have currently a mandate for a vaccination, and that may, uh, in the short term here, have a, a, an impact on our ability to deliver service. From a professional standpoint, um, the flexibility that we see within our riders, we're seeing a lot in the, the flexible um, desire from our professionals. Lawyers, engineers uh, seem to be, we're having a hard time re retaining those type of positions. On the more frontline workforce, mechanics, car cleaners, trackmen, uh, we had a hiring event in June. Uh, we were looking to hire about 150 employees. We had just under 8,000 applicants. So, little bit different than the story that uh, CTA has. Um, we certainly right now have a, a very, very large pool of, of applicants in those uh, fields. But interestingly, as we uh, move forward in the process, we've actually seen people turn down the opportunity because of COVID uh, mandates. We've seen people turn down the opportunity because uh, they, they thought maybe they were going to have a more flexible uh, work life. But you know, in the field out there, the railroad operates seven days a week, 365 a year. And for them, that realization, they were, they moved on. We have more training programs active right now than I've ever seen in the past 10 years. Um, two conductors classes, one just finished, one just starting an engineer's class, an apprentice class with another apprentice class. We have a signalman class and, and all of those uh, programs seem to have a very robust um, pool to, to draw from right now. Thank you. And, and that just leads me to my last question. Understanding the new 2022 OSHA regulation on vaccines and mandates, COVID-19 in the workplace, it brings up safety, security, and reporting requirements. Do you have a, a plan in place to kind of put it all together? I know it's a very, it's changing. It's very complex. Is there a framework and plan? Well, right now we have a mandate in place and we're going to review OSHA's uh, latest um, announcement uh, shortly here we'll see how that uh, affects things i mean as you point out that you couldn't come up with anything more complex and certainly if you asked me a year ago was this going to be the thing i'd be concentrating on right now i'd absolutely not see this coming we least we spend at least one third of our day right now um combing over all the different things one of the thing metra did right now of course working with our labor unions as we have partied um, on a, a federal lawsuit to ensure that what we're doing within the collective bargaining agreement even is allowed so this is it's a complicated uh, matter um, um with regard to the safety of the employees it's always been a top priority and certainly that's something we have to show our passengers so uh, we are going to comply with osha we're going to comply with the mandates uh that we have and we're also looking at what flexibility we have with inside the the regulations that are coming out and changing quite often Thank you again, and thank you again for your great leadership. And uh, I, I see the difference. I've witnessed these trains; they look marvelous. And more importantly, I've seen the frequency in, uh, engage. So, as a resident of DuPage County, uh, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, Director Lewis has a raised hand, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Director Lewis, Michael. Uh, I, I apologize for the uh, background noise, uh, the ringing phone, but 
Well, first of all, Jim, a, a great presentation and a, a great um, uh, job that, that Metro is doing overall. I just have a couple of questions and some may touch on uh, comments that have been made earlier, but um, again, looking at inflation uh, and the fact that it is really ramped up so acutely, uh, how confident are you in your plans going forward on both the expense side uh, as well as the uh, cost side uh, for um, Metro? Because a lot of these numbers change so dramatically. I know you talked about 70% of your uh, fuel expenses have been covered by Ford contracts, but there are other aspects of your business that are going to be subject to uh, more or less a spot kind of a market relative to expenses. So um, how confident are you that um, the planning process has properly taken into account what Metro might incur? That's that's a, a great question. Thank you very much, Director Lewis. Um, we've been seeing a lot of uh, supply chain um, issues, not dramatically, but yeah, uh, but the ones that you, you sit back and you talk about. Okay, this this is just a little bit delayed, so nothing yet on the side of actually having delivery issues. On the on the cost side, um, I think the biggest inflationary thing that we worry about is what's going to happen to the resources that we're going to need to deliver on these these uh, capital projects, um, and just seeing what that is. The some of what we're seeing in the industry right now is uh, lack of resources and availability to um, have the the engineering firms, the design firms, and and the construction firms available. And I think that's where we're gonna start really seeing some inflationary measures on the bigger projects that are out there. With regard to fuel, as you pointed out, we, we've we um, got a couple years under our belt where we can control some of that. On the other side of this is we, on a normal basis, are always looking to be more efficient, to give ourselves that little bit of cushion for those unknowns as, as um, they come at us. Um, inflationarily, uh, we've um, budgeted for the, the labor um, uh, moving forward directly here at Metra. It, my biggest concern is uh, the um, outside help that we have to secure. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. My second and, and final question, which again borders on both a question as well as a statement. I, I was encouraged to hear uh, when Director Andalcio asked you um, the commitments you've made in terms of diversity and inclusion, particularly as it relates to the uh, staff, the suppliers, um, uh, and, and a lot of the entities that want to work with Metra. Uh, my, my question, therefore, becomes at the governance level, where I think there's not a lot of control on the part of the service agencies. You know, are there efforts in your strategic plan to look at all aspects of what Metro is doing? Because it's pretty clear that, you know, the, the diversity uh, of our market and our region really requires that we reflect that diversity in the way we uh, govern, lead ourselves and, and work with suppliers. So uh, it, it, it may be something that you can't comment on, uh, but I just wonder if that's a fact that's taken into account. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to help you in that regard. No, that's um, it's a great point. Um, earlier this summer, we put together internally um, a commitment that we're going to start looking at diversity, equity, inclusion uh, more broadly. So we've got some people that have been assigned, not necessarily a department like the CTA has. But we've got people assigned to bring forth some of the industry best practices out there, some of uh, what we're seeing from a government standpoint. And we're going to bring that to our board as part of our strategic initiatives in 2022. So that one's kind of like uh, in the works. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate all your all your effort. Thank you. Thanks, Director Luz. Other questions or comments? Director Gorman has a raised hand. Yes, Director Gorman. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Jim, for your um, complete uh, synopsis and your presentation. And um, the, many of the questions were already addressed. So um, you, you know the safety issue that Dr. Indelcio addressed, but yeah, you know, just to be, to be brief on the uh, capital side, um, you, you mentioned our bridges. So Metro's bridges, obviously, they use them a lot. What's the split um, with the state and feds, or is that all on Metro? Yeah, it's not even the state and the feds. So it's uh, it's the uh, Metro and the freights. Okay. So it depends who owns the bridge. Um, so in in cases where Metro owns the bridge, it's one hundred percent Metro to take care of, maintain, and replace using whatever uh, resources we can. In a shared uh, use bridge, um, we we then partner with the um, the freight railroad, and then we usually do some type of thing. If we have fifty percent of the trains on that bridge, they have fifty percent of the trains on that bridge, and we typically come up with an agreement that's near a 50-50 split on the cost. 
The interesting one is on areas where it's 100 percent um, passenger service only, no freight service, but Metro doesn't own it. An example is the UP North Line bridges. So UP North Line bridges all the way up to Lake Bluff are are ancient. They're 1894. Um, we are in the process of uh, designing and getting ready to replace another 22 in the upcoming years. Uh, we just finished 22 bridges. No freight trains operate on those bridges. So 100% of that cost to replace those bridges is borne by Metra, i.e. the taxpayer. Already great. And, and then you also mentioned facility upgrades and that was also um, in your table. Are there facility upgrades beyond train stations? Yes, so we, we've actually just invested in Harvey. Uh, we actually bought an old uh, furniture warehouse and we're making a centralized warehouse, um, taking that property out there, cleaning it up, and gonna utilize it to make our, our basically our supply system more efficient. It's uh, located just off uh, I-294 and uh, Halstead. Um, our main facilities are, are old. Our oldest facility hit 95 years old this year. Um, it's infrastructure we constantly have to maintain, uh, the roof, uh, the walls, uh, the air conditioning. So we constantly have uh, budgetary items for all of the facilities that we have. Along with our PSAs, uh, those facilities that they utilize, Metro is required to uh, take care of those as well financially as they're used exclusively for uh, commuter service. And there's budgetary items in there. So they, we have a line item called facilities and, and um, parking. And inside that facilities one, we have um, multiple contracts in the next year for air conditioning, roofs, and paving, and things of that nature. All righty, great. And just as far as the diesel that's used in um, in the rolling stock, is any of that renewable, like biodiesel at all? Or can the equipment handle you know such a mix? No, so on, under EPA regulations, uh, what ends up happening is the manufacturers are required to certify that the diesel has a certain emission footprint. Tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier one plus, tier three. We don't have tier four at this point in time. As part of that certification process, they run that particular diesel through the uh, the sniffer, I like to call it. It's a giant big building. And they certify that with this combination, these fuel injectors, this particular diesel fuel, we all use ultra low sulfur diesel, um, that it meets those certification requirements. And what's happened in the bio world is they've attempted to kind of get to the manufacturer, say, hey, test our fuel, you know, get in there and then, you know, make that part of the certification as well. And what's happened in my understanding is the biofuels just haven't been able to perform nowhere near the level of the ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. They degrade the uh, fuel injector life and they actually uh, carbon up and gum up uh, some of the exhaust components, which then degrades the emission footprint that the EPA requires us to maintain. I already appreciate the answer and the questions and that's all I got, Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Director Gorman. Other hands raised, Mr. Secretary? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Director Carey has a raised hand. Yes, Director Carey. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Jim. And one thing I wanted to comment is I was very um, pleased to hear you talk about the Department of Capital Delivery and connecting that with your staff that works directly with the communities. Um, I, I just think that sounds like a, a great idea and I appreciate that initiative. Um, my question, I wanted to echo uh, Dr. S um, Dr. Sager's comments about debt and being open to that, and it because it leads into a question, a specific question about the Fulton Market Station. Um, sitting in on the seminar last week uh, that the RTA put on, uh, there were several examples of uh, people around the country talking about how um, how they were able to do things quickly and uh, to deal with changes that came from the pandemic. Um, now, I realize that in none of the service boards uh, typically can do things quickly because huge capital projects, there's a lot involved. But I think going forward, as we look at, you know, we talk about what is the future going to hold for us, we need to be as nimble as we possibly could be. So as you see the growth on the west side um, and the talk recently in the press about the uh, potential Fulton Street market, um, that might be an opportunity, and you even said it yourself, Jim, that you know you mentioned when you were talking about potential um, legitimate opportunities to incur debt. Um, so 
so I would, again, just echo Dr. Saga's comments and ask, where is the Fulton discussion of Fulton Street Market? Is it just, is it in your capital planning at all at this point? It's, it's uh, certainly not in the five-year capital program. The interesting thing, I think that it totally dynamically changes th this answer from one week ago is the uh, infrastructure bill that just got passed. You know, when you know what you have coming in and you know what you have to take care of just to get to a state of good repair and start bringing some things back together, you kind of sit in a more conservative world. So under core capacity um, type programs or new start programs, I think um, uh, we've got a great opportunity here in the region to try to leverage some federal dollars to do some really dramatic um, changes. One of the things that we've done, we do every year, we do it's called call for projects and the call for projects deals with a lot of different things. It never, it's never funded. It's, it's always shortly funded probably by 50%. But one of the things we do do is take a look at some of the more what I'll call bigger mega projects. And so we've been taking a look right now at something that we might be looking at as a corridor improvement project, an entire corridor. And taking a look at um, A2, which I think you might be familiar with, that ancient interlocker that we have to light on fire, uh, where we have almost 350 train movements pre-COVID over it just to keep it running in the middle of winter. That literally right there is such a pinch point and it could trap so many people if in, 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 a, in a derailment or a failure right there that that it's it's just something that has to be addressed. And so things like the A2 flyovers, uh, Fulton, Martin Pro Fulton Market projects, investment into um, broader electric vehicles, um, some of our other uh, things that we're looking at, potentially um, expanding a yard on the Northwest line, uh, looking at the aut old auto pound downtown. We've been working with the city on that because all of our yards downtown are at full capacity. There, there's, there's a very big list of things that we would love to improve on. But I think right now, as, as it's a week later, the ability to look at starting to really leverage some of these, these uh, federal programs is gonna totally change what the next five years look like with regard to what we wanna start going after. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the comments. Thank you. Thanks, Director Curry. Director Melvin has a question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Director Melvin. Okay, good. Let me take my hand down there. Um, three, three, three quick comments, Jim. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, great leadership. Um, you know, as always. Uh, also, you know, I've mentioned to you before, I'm always amazed at, uh, you, you know, your range, uh, you have a lot of complex issues. You can give a tremendous amount of detail and information to us on a wide range of uh, complex things. So thank you for that. And lastly, uh, my friends who are using Metra, uh, give you very, very high marks on the condition of the cars. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks director Melvin. Um, Director Colson has a raised hand, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Director Colson. Well, I believe you're on mute, Mr. Uh, Director Colson. Potential metro takeover of the operation. I noticed that it's not budgeted now. Um, so my question is, if you could talk about it publicly, um, could it be a financial plus or a financial minus for Metra? And how imminent is some resolution of this issue? I, I missed the beginning of your question, but I, I'm certain it's uh, Union Pacific. Yes, the, the potential takeover. It's not in the budget. How imminent is it? Can you even comment publicly on where you are on this? I'll comment broadly publicly uh, from uh, where the SR-71 flies overhead, pretty high up there. Um, we're in negotiations continually with the Union Pacific um, over basically three fundamental um, issues, labor, real estate, and basically access fees um, moving forward. Currently today, we have a purchase and service agreement with Union Pacific, um, it, they provide all of that. So as we move forward and they want to get out of the commuter business, we see ourselves as the perfect operator. We see their employees 
as being the perfect employees to hire, obviously, since they already run the system. Budgetarily, um, their employees make a different wage than ours. Um, budgetarily, um, the Union Pacific would certainly like to see a different arrangement when it comes to access to their network. And that's what we actually start uh, having conversations with. So I'm not going to get into the details of the exact negotiations, but I will tell you, yes, there absolutely can be a financial impact to Metro, both on the operating side and potentially if real estate acquisition is something that we need to look at to make sure that Metro's future and destiny are in our hands and also can help reduce our operating costs. Uh, real estate acquisition uh, is definitely going to take up a good chunk of uh, capital investment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Director Colson. Mr. Chairman, Director Sager has a raised hand. Yeah, Doctor. Uh, Jim, very, very quickly, I, I think we would be remiss if we did not uh, extend our accommodations with regards to a couple of different things. First is uh, your accomplishments associated with the positive drink control of the PDC. I think that that's an exceptional uh, accomplishment. I think that it certainly is going to be a, a hole that we have to keep filling year after year after year. But I, I truly want to say thank you and uh, well done in that. Second, I really appreciate the efforts that you're going about uh, currently with regards to surveys. I think that that is a, a huge area to provide an input from writers, and I think that uh, you're doing a great job there. And the third, uh, accommodation for your plans uh, to put uh, ticket vending machines in, I think that that's a great uh, service in terms of accessibility and convenience uh, for writers, and hopefully we'll encourage increased ridership. So I just want to say that uh, congratulations and thanks for all those efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Seiger. Uh, no additional hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. Um, Jim, good luck with uh, winter preparation. I know as uh, this time approaches, you've got so many different issues, new issues on your platter, but uh, as we all know too well, winter preparation uh, is, uh, is a big one for you. And it's a big one that uh, uh, writers watch out for. So. Uh, Good luck with with winter preparations. Um, I just want to commend your innovation, uh, and and also, you know, sometimes railroads, which Metro is obviously one, get stereotyped as sort of these big behemoth, slow uh, to to move or or innovate. Um, not only are you innovating, you're innovating very quickly, uh, and uh, I can't. Thank you enough and, and thank your team enough for really coming up with some great innovative things. And I guess my last comment um, is, uh, and I tried to stress this in a conversation I had with the mayor recently, uh, and I think President Preckwinkle also knows this, Metra is now becoming more important. You've always sort of been viewed as a suburban operation. You're much more than that. But you're more important now to the city of Chicago than you've ever been. I mean, we touched on Fulton Market. Um, obviously, I saw the Tribune, you know, thinks you should just have a whistle stop there and put down a milk crate and let people on and off. And it's much more complex than that. Um, but Fulton Market is something, I, as, as other directors have said, I would really focus on. I, I just, uh, it's, it's critical. Uh, it has the attention of a lot of people. and. Um, it's one of the, the, the economic boon areas of Chicago, but your South Cook Fair Transit Program uh, and other things that you're doing within the city of Chicago are, are critical and the innovation's great. Uh, the other thing is the Central Business District of Chicago. Um, you know, nothing is more important since almost 65 to 66 percent of everybody that was working down there pre-pandemic arrived by mass transit, including yours truly. Um, Metra is obviously at the heart of that. Uh, so you're more important to the city uh, than you've ever been. And then last but not least, um, I wanna thank you uh, over the last couple of weeks as we looked at that little 
uh, $40 million pool of money. Um, I thank you as I do every day for being a great team player. I'm obviously CTA, Metra and Pace uh, are, we're all in this together. We're all one region. Um, folks like my sister take uh, two of those legs uh, every day to work. Uh, and I can't thank you enough for uh, your, your flexibility uh, and just being a, a very good team player. Well, you're obviously Metra's number one cheerleader and advocate. Um, I deeply appreciate you uh, um, really knowing that you're part of a larger regional transit system uh, and, uh, and being a, a real fine team player. So thank you, my hat's off to you and uh, here's to a mild winter. Thanks, Jim. Thank you much. And, you know, I'll take the any worse winter. Just don't give me any more of these global pandemics. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let's move on uh, last, but certainly not least, because uh, we're going to feed him in a minute. But um, Rocky Donahue and, and Pace uh, and Rocky uh, Director uh, J.D. Ross and I um, were exhilarated to come out to your 10 year anniversary of the Bus on Shoulder program in Plainfield this week. Uh, and uh, again, talking about innovation, uh, it's the 10 year anniversary of Bus on Shoulder, uh, which is literally our, our fastest growing uh, and one of our great success stories of the Regional Transportation um, Authority. Uh, and uh, Rocky, thank you so much. So the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Dillard and members of the board. And, and thank you. We were very excited to celebrate our 10 year anniversary of bus on shoulders and and we're honored that both you and and um director ross could join us uh, again i'm rocky donahue i'd like to begin by uh thanking leanne and b and and all of the rta budget and finance staff they've collaborated they've worked hard with us um throughout this process and we've appreciated their leadership in in their help in developing this budget um, with me are, are some PACE employees I'd like to introduce, our Chief Operating Officer and General Manager, Melinda Metzger, our Chief Financial Officer, Lori Newson, and our Department Manager of Budget, uh, Melanie Castle. I'm going to try to today to, to provide a, a high-level overview of our 2022 budget, and then I'm going to turn it over to Melanie to, to really get into the nuts and bolts and the details. Um, so it starts, and I can tell you it's I'm very happy and quite honestly, very excited to present a positive budget for PACE in 2022. I will actually call this budget historic. In my nearly 40 years of working for this agency, this is the most positive budget we've ever introduced. Um, before actually getting into the budget, I can tell you with certainty, we are as healthy, strong, and stable from a fiscal perspective than we've ever been in the history of our organization. And this isn't by accident nor by luck. Very early on in the pandemic, we prioritized the fiscal side of our house. We reduced expenses, we tightened our belts, we made sacrifices. Quite honestly, those efforts have paid off. In fact, this year in 2021 through September, we're living within our means. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're not using federal stimulus funds to balance our budget. Our fare box revenue and our share of public funding sales tax is providing enough revenue to cover our current expenses. We're gonna come out on the other side of COVID, very healthy, very strong and very stable. And we're just not going to build back our system as it was, but we're truly going to build it back better. And we start building it back better beginning with our 2022 budget. Um, we recently released the region's first post COVID strategic plan, driving innovation, which will provide our agency the blueprint on how to build back better. So can we put up the next slide, please? Our 2022 budget calls for no fare increase. But the reality is we'll probably actually decrease fares in 2022, because if C CTA, as they've talked earlier, implements their fare 
um, decreases that they're planning for will follow suit. And why is that? Well, our fares with CTA are very intertwined, not only through Ventra, but as, as President Carter said, we try to coordinate that with our passengers. We try to assure that things are as seamless as possible. So if CTA ultimately goes through with it as their budget proposes, I, um, it's more than likely PACE would, would follow suit on those fares that impact our agency. But there will be no fare increase, but potentially in some cases a fare decrease to correspond with CTA. Um, we are planning a $15 million enhancement of service. This is the largest one-time enhancement of service in our agency's history. To give you a little perspective, the largest amount of service we put in at any one time was about five years ago, and that was $6 million when we, when we started our I-90 service in collaboration with the tollway from Elgin to Rosemont. This is two and a half times that, $15 million. That $15 million is split almost equally between fixed route in our on-demand paratransit service. We're gonna be investing $7 million of enhanced fixed route service. Now, some of you will say, but you know what, Rock, you suspended a lot of service during COVID. So is this really an enhancement or is it just you're bringing back that suspended service? Um, we're not gonna be bringing back that suspended service. Truth is some of those routes just weren't good routes to begin with. And for either we didn't have the financial resources to build service on top and then pull them out, or there wasn't the political will to pull them out. But due to COVID, when we canceled the route, it's giving us now an opportunity to just not bring service back, but to bring it back better. So what do I mean by that? What are we gonna do with most of that $7 million is we're going to invest uh, the good portion of that into our top 20 routes. Our top 20 routes carry 50% of our ridership. The other 50% is on the other 125 or 150 routes that we serve. So we've often said, well, what if we made those top 20 routes better? What if we made them more reliable, more accessible? Would that be a better bang for our buck than putting service out into areas um, where service is needed, but just doesn't have the density, just doesn't have the ridership. Well, we piloted this last year. Uh, Jim talked a little bit about it with the, with the Fair Cook Transit Project. Well, we, our portion of that, besides coordinating with Metro, was with us in Cook County, we beefed up service on our Route 352, which runs on Halstead. That's the number one route in PACE's whole system for ridership. It goes from basically Chicago Heights to the CTA 95th Street and it goes down Halstead Avenue. And we made the service more reliable, more dependable. Instead of it running every 15 or 20 minutes, a bus comes every seven minutes now provides greater opportunity, more dependability. And what happens, similar to what Jim told you, Route 352 is not only growing ridership, but it's growing faster than the rest of the system. So it's told us, if you make the service more dependable, more reliable, that good service, people will use it. So we're gonna do that to other 19 routes instead of the bus coming every 30 minutes like it does. Our hope is it'll come every 15 minutes. We're gonna extend the hours. Instead of stopping at seven o'clock at night, maybe we'll run till nine, 10 o'clock in the evening and we're gonna enhance our weekend service on those top 20 routes. We're gonna make it more attractive. We're gonna make it more reliable. We're gonna make it more dependable. But there are also many areas in our region that also need transit service. And we can't just say, well, because you're not part of that top 20 routes, you don't get any service. Um, so we're gonna try to pilot something new and something innovative. We're gonna spend $5 million throughout the region to implement a on-demand TNC Uber Lyft pilot projects. And I'll give you Naperville as the example because that's one of the areas we're gonna be doing this in. Prior to COVID, if you lived in Naperville, the third largest city in the state of Illinois, the only bus service you had was from your subdivision to the train station. We had 
what we called metro feeder routes. So if you lived in Naperville and needed to get to the train station, you could do that and you could do it very well. If you needed to go to the grocery store or if you just wanted to go downtown Naperville for entertainment, you needed to go to Walgreens to pick up a prescription, bus service wasn't available. We didn't operate it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna subsidize Uber and Lyft trips in Naperville. And so you'll pay the $2 bus fare and you'll get either a 10 or $15 Uber ride within Naperville. And if you still need to go to the train station, you'll be able to do that. If you need to go to Walgreens or to the grocery store or to employment that isn't by Metro downtown, you'll be able to do that as well. We believe this is gonna provide more access to the communities. It's gonna provide more ability options. Quite honestly, we believe it'll be a better use of our resources. It's gonna address those first mile and last mile challenges that, that you've already talked about this morning. And it's gonna also help us with a, a challenge we are facing right now and that's manpower. Um, we're having a dickens of a time attracting bus operators and mechanics. And our fear is if we were just to put fixed route service in but couldn't hire the drivers, <laughs> that would make the service even less dependable and less reliable because trips would get missed. There wouldn't be a driver to do the run. This gets addressed by using the manpower that's already out there with these Uber and Lyfts. So $7 million on the fixed route side, $5 million for this regional TNC pilot, and then we're gonna spend $3 million to enhance our regional dial-a-ride and paratransit system, which is primarily for elderly and people with disabilities. And that's pretty much gonna be in three different buckets. The first bucket is all of our current dollar ride partners are gonna get a 15% increase in their funding from PACE. Um, how dollar ride works now is it's a partnership. We pay for a portion of it. Generally the township or a community pays a portion. And we provide the vehicles and the drivers. We've, we've talked about inflation. We've talked about costs going up. Well, they're going up for our, our, our partners, other local governments, and we're gonna do our part and provide them more funding towards this such needed service. And we estimate that's gonna cost us about a million dollars. We're gonna do a million dollar pilot, as I mentioned, for general Uber Lyft, but we're gonna do a million dollar Uber Lyft pilot just for senior citizens and people with disabilities. And this is being modeled after what we do in the city of Chicago for our ADA riders and what we call the TAP program, Taxi Access Program. In the city of Chicago, those individuals who ride ADA can get a $30 taxi ride for the $3 fare. Um, we've often been asked in, by our suburban residents, why can't we have what you do in the city? Why can't we do that here in the suburbs? Reality is the taxi infrastructure just doesn't exist in the suburbs. There aren't cabs in all the suburbs. And there's 250 communities. That means there's 250 licenses. There isn't a regional taxi provider. So if they're licensed, say, to operate in Schaumburg, but they're not licensed to operate in Arlington Heights and, and the person, that's where they needed to go, that cab really does them no good. But Uber and Lyfts may be able to, to, to fill that void. And so the idea is, again, to, to provide for those residents, seniors and people with disabilities, a $30 Uber Lyft ride for the $3 fare. A um, couple things you may say is, well, sounds like a lot of money, $30 subsidy for a $3 fare. Yeah, it could be a lot of money, but the harsh reality is how we do it now on ADA paratransit, the average trip costs $50. This is actually going to save us money. So it's not only better for us as an agency being fiscally responsible, it's better for the taxpayer. Um, it's better for the customer. They're going to get an on-demand type of service. And what I mean by that is, is if their friend were to call them today and say, hey, you want to go to lunch today? Um, the current system, they can't do that because you have to schedule your ride 24 hours in advance. So they'd say, well, if you want to go to lunch tomorrow, I'll call Pace and schedule a ride for tomorrow, but I can't do it today. Well, this will allow them that freedom for on demand. And it helps us with, we believe, with the manpower issue I talked about earlier, we're facing that on our paratransit side of the house as well. Quite honestly, um, 
Our system is suffering right now because of the manpower issue. It's not running on the on-time performance we, we'd like it to be. Um, service is being slowed down. So if we can move more trips to other alternatives, that frees up the resources we have to provide those trips we have to do on the ADA paratransit. So a million dollars in increased funding, a million dollars for the Uber Lyft pilot. And then to our collar counties, we are going to give each of them a $200,000 grant for DuPage, Kane, Lake, McHenry, and Will for them to expand their dial of rides countywide. Well, you're gonna say potentially, well, we already have that. There's already ride DuPage. And there's already ride in Kane, and there's already MC ride in McHenry, and that's true. But while it's it's advertised as as a countywide service, there are pockets in all of those counties where communities do not participate in it. And what we've learned is why they don't participate. It's generally because of finances. Either they don't have the finances to join the program, or they don't believe there'll be demand within their community that it makes fiscal sense for them to join. So this $200,000 to each county is to hopefully incentivize those areas that are not part of the program to join the program. Here's the money and let's now make the entire county accessible to public transit. Let's now make the entire county have those mobility options and, and all of our residents throughout the county can, can have that safety net of knowing that public transit is there. Um, so again, $15 million, $7 million in fixed route, $5 million in, in a regional Uber, Lyft, TNC on demand pilot projects, and then $3 million on the, on the paratransit dialer ride side. But probably the most exciting thing to me in our 2022 budget is we are investing $10 million of PACE funds for an electric bus pilot at our North Division garage in Waukegan. And over the next four years, we'll spend an additional $50 million to convert our entire North Division fleet, which is about 52 buses, to all electric by the end of 2026. That $10 million in 2022, $4 million of it is to upgrade the garage infrastructure to support having electrical vehicles there. And six million is to start the purchase of the vehicles. Um, similar to what you heard from CTA, the PACE board has also adopted a goal that our entire PACE system will be zero emission by 2040. This pilot next year is the start of transitioning the system to zero emission. Um, in 2022, we'll also be undergoing a facility study and a fleet cost plan, very similar to what you heard President Carter tell you he's hoping to have by the end of this year to share with you. We're hoping to have by the end of 2022 that plan that will specifically identify what it will take to achieve being entirely zero emission by 2040. Can we go to the next slide, please? 2022 also continues our largest infrastructure enhancement of our agency's history. We're going to spend 300 plus million over the next three to five years on capital upgrades. These are primarily being funded with State of Illinois Rebuild Illinois funds. These projects include our Plainfield Garage, which is set to open in May of next year. Our Joliet Transit Center, we're gonna be operating service out of that this December with the official opening we, we believe in March. We've broken ground on our South Campus in Markham, which will which will house our operations that are currently taking place in South Holland at quite honestly an obsolete and, and a facility that's reached its useful life. We will be starting construction next year on our Wheeling Garage, which will take the place of our Northwest Division and Displains, which has actually more buses parked outside every day than it does in the garage. So that garage was built over 50 years ago to support a, a a bus system the size of 40 vehicles, and we now have roughly 120 vehicles at that garage. We've purchased land to expand our river division in Elgin. This is gonna save us money because we're currently leasing space in East Dundee to house our I-90 vehicles because we don't have enough room in Elgin. We're gonna start construction on our Dempster Pulse line. 
We are expanding our footprint in Schaumburg at our transit center and building an ADA pair transit center. In Calumet City, we're building an ADA pair transit transfer center. We're partnering with Metra, IDOT, the city of Harvey on a new state of the art multimodal center in Harvey. And we're going to continue our ADA pair transit technology improvements. Um, lastly, I too want to thank all PACE employees. And quite honestly, I want to thank all the employees at CTA, Metro, and RTA as well. All of our transit system employees are truly heroes moving heroes. They ensure our region has accessibility and mobility to get to work, school, medical appointments, or just be part of the community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melanie Castle, who will walk you through the finer points of our 2022 budget. And I'll be happy to address any questions the board may have after Melanie's presentation. Thank you, Rocky. Uh, good morning, Chairman Dillard and members of the board. As Rocky mentioned, my name is Melanie Castle, and I am the Department Manager of Budget Planning and Analysis at PACE. I'll start this morning with a brief overview of our suburban service budget. So if we could see the next slide, please. Um, just to start with 2021 and where we think we're going to end, um, 2021 operating revenue without any federal assistance is expected to come in at $29.6 million, which is $9.9 million under our 2021 budget. Um, Fairbox revenue accounts for the majority of this shortfall. When the 2021 ridership budget was developed, we expected to come in at about 60% of 2019 pre-pandemic actual. However, that estimate was revised down to just under 43% in line with our July 2021 year-to-date ridership when this estimate was developed. The good news is, is that through September, ridership performance has ticked up slightly uh, with the return of school service. Um, and is now nearer to 50% of the pre-pandemic actual year to date. The remaining shortfall in revenue is due to demand response local share revenue. Um, reduced ridership um, also has the effect of reducing demand response expenses. When you reduce demand, expense, uh, demand response expenses, uh, the local share contribution from our partners also goes down. Operating expense is estimated to end the year at $240 million. This is mostly due to the return of previously uh, reduced or reinstated services, as well as the reintroduction of school trip service in August. We're also actively filling positions which have remained vacant since March of 2020 as a cost saving measure and fuel expense is going to end the year over budget. Um, in the 2021 budget, we had estimated that diesel was going to average $1.66 a gallon for the year, um, but has already gone above $2 a gallon on average through September. At one point in 2020, PACE paid less than a dollar per gallon for diesel, so it is a very significant increase, um, as we're all aware. Moving down to the public funding line here, PACE's 2021 sales tax estimate is um, just under 190 million, and we will also use RTA, ICE, and other federal funding to reach a 2021 um, public funding estimate of 198 million. This is more than $50 million above our initial 2021 budget without federal relief funding. Therefore, it has reduced our expected 2021 funding deficit to $12.7 million, that net funding available line. Um, this funding deficit will be filled with PACE's CARES funding allocation. For 2022, operating revenue is expected to increase slightly to 30.9 million. This is mostly associated with Fairbox revenue growth from the uh, restored services in 21 and 22. The slight decrease in revenue um, in 2023 is due to the end of the subsidy from Cook County for the Fair Transit South Cook uh, project um, and the end of a number of reimbursable operating grants for service studies, which will end in 22. Uh, revenue does then rebound slightly in 24. Operating expense is expected to increase 13% in 2022 before leveling off to 4.3% and 3.9% in 23 and 24. PACE is considering 2022 to be a rebuilding year um, after significant expense reductions in 2020. We'll see a full year impact of the service restoration and increased hiring, which have started this year, 
as well as expenses associated in increased fuel price and consumption. PACE also plans to implement the second Pulse Corridor um, on Dempster Street in June of 2022. 2022 public funding, including sales tax and other federal funding, is expected to essentially stay flat to 2021 before growing moderately in 23 and 24. Um, RTA ICE funding that we were using for Milwaukee Pulse operations will uh, be exhausted by year end 21. And a CMAC grant that we received for I-90 operations um, will be exhausted at year end 22. PACE has been awarded a CMAC grant for Dempster Pulse operations, which is programmed through 2024. And PACE will use our federal relief funding to make up the funding deficit through 24 um, that you see here. So 44.8 million and onwards through 22. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Moving on to the ADA paratransit budget, um, the original 2021 ADA budget planned for RTA certification trips to resume and a TAP fare that was suspended um, in 2020 to be reinstated. Um, and it also planned for ridership to be at 60% of the 2019 pre-pandemic actual. The good news is that the ADA paratransit uh, service has already exceeded that 60% ridership goal by year end 2020. So in March of 2021, the ADA budget was revised to increase the ridership estimate to 75% of pre-pandemic actual, as well as to account for the continued suspension of RTA certification trips and the continued suspension of TAP fare collection. ADA Paratransit was allocated $20 million of the region's federal CARISA funding to offset the revenue loss and expense increase associated with the additional ridership. 2021 operating revenue is expected to end the year $1.5 million under the revised budget, despite the ridership estimate actually being very close to plan at 72% of 2019 pre-pandemic actual. This is due to a shift in the proportion of the ridership estimate between city service carriers and our taxi access or TAP program. PACE has suspended the TAP fare, which when those riders do shift to that service, we do not collect the fare from them that we had been expecting. While the shift in TAP has reduced the fare box revenue estimate, it has significant benefits on the expense side because the cost per passenger for TAP is more than $60 lower than the city carriers. Um, this has helped offset a 15.4% increase in the variable cost per hour for our Chicago and South Cook carriers due to um, an increase in the local minimum wage as of July 1st of this year. In total, we expect 2021 expense to end the year about $500,000 below the amended budget. The expense savings were not enough to offset the revenue loss, uh, resulting in a $20.9 million deficit at year end. We'll use the $20 million of CARISA funding allocated to ADA to minimize this deficit um, up, to that, up to that level. If the additional $900,000 deficit remains at the end of the year, we'll work with RTA staff to true up ADA. For 2022, operating revenue is expected to grow 2.7 million from the 2021 estimate. While PACE plans to keep the TAP fare suspended, the increase reflects a projected ridership increase to approximately 80% of pre-pandemic actual and the return of RTA certification service. 2022 expenses are also expected to grow as a result of the ridership increase as well as the full year impact of the minimum wage increase. The funding requirement of 216.4 million is fully funded with sales tax and state funding for ADA operations. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So looking forward to our five-year capital program, um, PACE's five-year capital budget totals 289 million. Um, the largest category is rolling stock comprising 60% of the program, while support facilities and passenger facilities make up 18% each. The five-year funding is similar to that of our 2022. If you were to just look at 2022 on a pie chart, um, it's, it's very similar with approximately three quarters comprised of federal sources. This, um, as with the other service boards, this does not yet include any projected increase resulting from the infrastructure bill. The five-year program funds all of PACE's vehicle replacement needs to keep our fleet in peak condition for our passengers, including a total of 52 electric buses, representing a goal of replacing all diesel buses at North Division Garage, and 39 million for additional charging infrastructure at North, Southwest, and North Shore Divisions. 
The program contains another 39 million to improve passenger facilities, which may include charging infrastructure at various transit centers. Finally, the funding uh, will meet all of the needs of the ongoing programs, such as our transit signal priority and intelligent bus system, uh, sign and shelter program, computer systems and support equipment. Um, I know we are short on time, so this concludes Pace's budget presentation and obviously we are happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Mel. Uh, questions of uh, Pace? One moment, Mr. Chairman. Or comments? Uh, Director Carey has a raised hand, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Director Carey. Thanks for the uh, very informative presentation. I appreciate it. Um, question is about you talk about, and I'm very happy to hear your goals to move to zero emission by 2040. And I believe, if I understood correctly, um, there's what you call the North Division, I think, would be all electric by 2026. Um, yet you're continuing to invest in the CNG. I'm just wondering, and I completely acknowledge that it is always very difficult to walk away from a project that has already um that one has made an investment in already but it is it possibly the right thing to do to uh stop spending any further resources on cng buses or cng um uh, equipment infrastructure given that cng is not zero emission um so i i'm just curious your thoughts on that um thank you director Kerry. it's a great question and it's it's it's, it's I wish there was an easy answer, and I say that very sincerely. Um, our our goal is, yes, we have to be conscientious of of the environment and do our part. And pace always has. Seven years ago when when we converted our our south division to CNG, we were applauded. It was at that time emerging technology. It was much better than diesel. And now, as, as, as you've stated and we realize, there's, there's other technology that exists. But, but our main goal is we have to provide service on the street. We have, we have 800 vehicles. And, and let's just take one garage. I think the one you're, you're kind of maybe pointing out is our, our wheeling facility, which will house roughly 150 to 175 vehicles. Today's price, ballpark figure, is a million dollars a vehicle for an electric bus. I'm not, I know it might be a little bit cheaper, it might be a, 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 little, a little higher, but it's roughly ballpark a million dollars. So just to replace the vehicles there to provide service on the street is, is 150 to 175 million. Now, there's also the challenge of the community infrastructure for the, for the charge of these vehicles. That that doesn't exist, and I and we're very appreciative of of the federal program, which calls for a lot of electrification. But that money hasn't flown yet. I mean, hasn't come yet to us. And then we have to to build it. But in the meantime, I still have to keep buses on the street. Um, while while electric has definitely advantages, and that's why we're moving in that regard. Currently, we've we've seen what other what has happened in other cold weather climates, and I'll point to Minneapolis for example. Minneapolis went a pilot of electric buses during the winter time. Um, the batteries had to heat the bus, and as a result, the life expectancy of of the battery was even lessened. And and Minneapolis then said, "Well, if it's going to take three electric buses to do the job of of one diesel bus." in the cold weather until we can figure out how that battery's perspective. So let's just using that study, and I'm not saying that's the it's necessarily going to happen here, but now 150 buses, even if it's two buses for one, is 300 buses. And that's $300 million ballpark, because the technology isn't quite where we want it to be. The costs aren't quite there yet. The money hasn't really come to us yet. And, and that's why we're also doing the plan to see what it takes and how it goes. Um, CNG is our bridge to, to get to zero emission. And I can't even tell you it's gonna necessarily be all electric. 
right now being demonstrated right down the road from us in Champaign-Urbana is a hydrogen fuel cell bus, which, which compresses hydrogen. And so starting with CNG might actually be a, in the long run, better for us because we might be able to easily convert that instead of compressing natural gas, compress hydrogen to operate our fuel for, for the future. So while I'm very committed and, and I think we're demonstrating it by, by our $10 million in 2022, by 2026, Waukegan being all zero emission, a goal of 2040, and, and very similar to what CTA told you, that's our floor, not our ceiling. If this money flows and we can speed that, that timeline up, we definitely will. But I have to make sure I have dependable service on the street. And just as Dorval said, the demand right now on this new technology, the bus manufacturers aren't able to produce the equipment fast enough. So I've given you a lot there. I know you asked me what time it is, and I probably told you how to build a clock. I apologize for that, but I hope that that helps somewhat. No, no, I really appreciate that, Rocky. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with what they're doing in Champaign, so I'm also happy to hear you mention looking into the hydrogen uh, fuel cell. And uh, I'll look forward to your plan um, of how to get to 2040 um, with zero emissions. So I, I do appreciate the answers. And I understand the practicality of uh, needing to have buses on the road. Um, one other quick question. It, your projection for ridership um, is, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's like 41 to 43, and it only gets up to like 45 or 46 in 2024. It doesn't seem like much of an increase. Um, it seems somewhat pessimistic. Um, yeah, and so I don't, I can't necessarily disagree with you. And, and what I will say about a budget, it's, it's kind of a snapshot in time. And when we started our, our budget projection in earnest back in, in the spring and then early summer, um, that's how we saw ridership trending. We've, we've made a commitment, as, I, as I've said to you, to, to, to view things differently with the Ubers and Lyfts and, and different models and, and getting away from, from what I would call peak hour service and enhancing our non-traditional transit in midday and Saturdays and Sundays. And so we're not really sure what that is going to mean. So that's, I think, rolled into part of it. The other piece of it though, is since, since we looked at it, that snapshot in time, we've brought back some of the services. And, and as Melanie's pointed out, ridership is doing better than we thought. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we brought to you budget amendments in 22 that reflected that very similar to what we did in 21 and quite honestly, very similar to what the board, I believe if legislative intent is the right term, board intent of what you've done with the art money where you said, okay, here's what we think it looks like right now today, how we're gonna divide it. But in, at some point in time in the future, we're gonna, we're gonna relook at it and maybe reallocate it and, and that's, my hope is, um, as it relates to ridership, it will be better. And, and truthfully, it already is. As, as you've mentioned, our budget, when we developed it, we thought it was 45%. Since we've added the new service we put in, in uh, roughly around Labor Day, it's already bounced up to 50% just from that. So we're, we're, we believe as we bring in more of these trials and demonstrations, it might do better than we originally thought. And, but at the time when we developed it, it was our best projection. Okay, thanks again, Rocky. Thank you. For hands, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Director Indalcio has a hand raised. Yes, David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief and sensitive of time. Um, again, thank you for your innovative leadership uh, during these times. Uh, uh, you're doing a marvelous job and more importantly, your tenure. Um, so again, um, you talked about the frequency, just dovetailing in Director Carey's comments, so I'll be a little more specific. So what plans uh, do you have to increase the frequency of stops in DuPage County? 
I, I'm sorry. I, I thought I heard your question. I'm just going to repeat it just to make sure to increase the frequency of stops in DuPage County. So, so I think that the answer I have for you is what I'm calling this non-traditional pilot TNC Uber Lyft. Because the truth was in DuPage County, you had very little pay service. Most of the pace service in DuPage County was what we called Metro feeder service. Took people from, from their communities to the Metro station. But if you needed to go from community to community, or if you had to go to, to work at an Amazon in, in West Chicago, you, you didn't have service to get there. Um, we don't have the resources to put in fixed route service that quite honestly isn't gonna carry enough people. So we're gonna look at these Uber Lyft type of demonstrations that'll be countywide. We're providing DuPage County with uh, additional funding to enhance their their ride DuPage system, which which is open as is to all residents of DuPage. Primarily we view that as for seniors and people with disabilities, but all residents of DuPage can use that. So we're looking at it from a non-traditional standpoint versus the traditional big bus on the street. Again, thank you for being innovative on that. That hybrid model definitely uh, seems to be working at this time. So I'm going to dive right in again, uh, speaking of the demographics in which you serve. Um, what what are we doing as far as promoting uh, DBEs, MBEs, uh, you know, employment opportunities for minority, minorities in leadership roles? I know you talked a little bit about that in your presentation, but if you could expand a little. Sure. Um, if I can start with the second half first with the leadership roles at PACE itself, um, three people I have here with you today, our Chief Operating Officer, General Manager, Melinda Metzger, a woman. Our Chief Financial Officer, Lori Newsom, an African-American woman. Our Department Manager of Budget, Melanie Castle, a woman. Our Chief Procurement Officer is a Latino. Our general counsel is a female. Our chief auditor is an African-American female. We've, we've worked really hard to, to diversify upper management at PACE. And if I'm gonna be criticized for anything, it's mostly women. It's women of color, but it's mostly women. Um, we've, we've created an office of diversity and inclusion. Um, it's just getting off the ground and it's, going to address some of those things you've said about hiring throughout the agency. 70% of our workforce right now is, is our people of color, our minorities, but they're mostly, most of our workforce are, are drivers and mechanics. But we've, as I've demonstrated, hopefully have, have shown, we, we have a very diversified management workforce as well. DBE, MBEs, small businesses. Um, truth is we didn't really, have a very robust DBE MBE program because we didn't really have the projects that that kind of fell into that. We didn't have big capital projects. Our our capital projects were we bought buses, and and there weren't bus manufacturers in Illinois, so our buses were built either in California or somewhere else. But now with Rebuild Illinois and all those projects I've laid out, we have we have part of that Office of Diversity and Inclusion is we have really beefed up what I would call our DB and beefed up for us. Others may laugh at it, but but beefed up from Pace's perspective, our, our DBE participation at our Plainfield garage was 25%. Um, we are holding uh, our vendors' feet accountable and trying to get those primes to, to, to interact with them. And the one success story I'll tell you, one, one DBE we did a long time ago was when we have our ADA paratransit system. We brought a DB in called SCR. And SCR now graduated from DB and has become a prime and they're the largest minority owned paratransit operator in the country. And it started with 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 that contract with Pace. So I think we can do it. We just haven't had quite honestly those type of projects that lend themselves to it, but we do now. And we're going to get better at it. Very impressive on the uh, employment opportunities and the intent is great. And I thank you uh, for, uh, you know, for all that you do. So this is very impressive. Uh, um, I am I, I, impressed with the diversity and inclusion department that they're looking forward 
um, you know, to increase participation. It's probably a mentor protege program at some time. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you answering the question. Thanks, Director Andalcio. Jeremy, other hands? Director Lewis has a raised hand, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll be uh, um, brief as well. I know that the hour's late. Um, the question that, that I had, uh, Rocky, is um, in listening to some of the impressive things that you're doing, I'm wondering, and this is a little bit of a flip, uh, how much marketing are we doing up marketing? Because I know I hear a lot from constituents here about what PACE is or isn't doing, but I heard a lot of innovative programs. I heard a lot of creativity. Is that being marketed adequately so people know what you're doing as opposed to it, it you know, it's like a tree falling in the forest. So could you speak to that briefly? Um, yes, brutally honest, the answer is no. We don't do enough marketing. We, we spend a million dollars a year for 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 marketing um and we have a 400 million dollar budget so we're we're doing <laughs> four four tenths of one percent of 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 our budget is is going to marketing and that's a challenge i don't think it's only with us i think with a lot of public entities we rely on kind of that free media to try to get the word out and it's something we have to do more of and it becomes kind of that do you use the resources to put into service and, and promote, or do you use those resources to, to promote those services you're putting out? We we have, um, I would say, done better about promotions recently, but we're we're woefully behind, and it's something we're we're constantly trying to find that right balance of, and and we have to do better at it, and 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 it's a great it's a great comment. I, I think it's just one man's opinion, but uh, I think that again, with a lot of the people that I talk to, particularly here in the suburbs, saying, "Gosh, I really don't know," um, it, it will be benefit ridership uh, and really kind of service utilization in the long run if that were something that could be incorporated in long-term strategic plans. So I, I just put that out there. My second and final point is really that combination of a. Of making a, a question as well as making a statement. You touched, uh, I think, magnificently on the fact that PACE has really kind of uh, tackled the issue of diversity. And I think uh, Director Andalcio started the conversation relative to, to not only DBEs, but staffing uh, as well as senior leadership. I think the last point is really governance. And that goes across all three service agencies where we look at the governance issue is another place that possibly, and I know that the service agencies don't have control over that. So that may be a place where advocacy is gonna be required on the part of, of uh, whether it be us or others to really make sure that we reflect appropriately the marketplace in which we serve. So I'll leave it with a statement. Uh, I, there's no uh, response necessary, but I want to make sure I got that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Lewis. Uh, Director Gorman, Mr. Chairman, has a raised hand. Yes, Director Gorman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rocky, for once again another wonderful presentation. I mean, over the years, it's just kind of um, ironic that I've sat through many PACE presentations um, with you, and I'm I'm thrilled to be part of your last one. So, um, kudos to you. Um, just just briefly, I know that um, you know at the Cook County. Um, budget um, hearing when you presented, you know, the electric vehicle, you know, was uh, a point of a, a point and then a point of contention. But I'm happy to see that, you know, at least there's a pilot program and, and it's a responsible way to start the, the electric vehicle um, immersion, if you will. Um, so is there anything just to expound upon briefly it is um, to, just to touch on that? Sure. Thank you, Director, and thank you for all your your supports and advice and and leadership through the years as well. Um. Yeah. You know, I I would say, Pace. I I tell you, I believe we've always been a leader in in this front. We we did hybrid um, buses in 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 the region before anybody else was doing it cta was doing it as well so i shouldn't say before anybody else was doing it but we we rolled out hybrid buses we rolled out compressed natural gas we've partnered with with idot on electric paratransit vehicles and we're going into electric buses and in, in zero emission 
but we've always taken what you said more of that cautious approach because it's not only service on the street we have an obligation to the taxpayer and it's easy to just kind of say yep let's just let's just go buy this and let's let's do this but we want to make sure that what we're doing is is the best investment and right now we're we're in, we're, we're going to demo um electric but but we're we're committed to zero emission not just committed to electric because we believe the technology may change we believe it is changing i mentioned the hydrogen fuel cell and i'm sure there's going to be <laughs> other generations of technology behind it but i i appreciate you recognizing that we're committed to it um i'd like it to go faster and it probably will now that now that we're going to get some of this federal money and and once we get that and see that I, I believe that number of 2040 will probably will probably get shrunk, but I we're going to always approach it in a in a realistic, responsible way for our writers, for the community, and for the taxpayer. But, but thank you, Director. Thank you. It, no, as always, you've you've done a great job. Thanks again, Rocky. Thanks, Director Borman. Other hands. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Director Melvin has a question. Raised hand. Yes, Chris. Yes, thanks. Hey, Rocky, I just want to say great job. I mean, I like the innovative thinking. I like the way that you're willing to, you know, think about things a certain way, break things up, rearrange things, try new stuff. Uh, and thank you also for walking through your thinking about zero emissions, not necessarily being electric and uh, the way you're approaching it. So thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I see no other hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So thank you, Rocky, very much, and and to and to others, uh, Melanie and others. Um, let's uh, use the chair's prerogative since Rocky, you're on, uh, and let's go to item seven C, Mr. Secretary, which is uh, the RTA's resolution honoring Mr. Donahue. Sure. Um, whereas Rocky Donahue has served as executive director of Pace Suburban Bus and ADA Paratransit since 2018, whereas Mr. Donahue has worked for Pace since the agency's inception in 1984, and prior to that began his career in transit at the Regional Transportation Authority as a financial analyst, whereas Mr. Donahue is, res is respected and admired by his transit colleagues at the RTA, CTA, Metro, and Pace as a dedicated and concerned public servant, whereas as executive director, some of his, Mr. Donahue's key accomplishments include the launch of the Milwaukee Avenue Pulse Line, implementation of PACE's first strategic plan in 17 years, and the creation of PACE's first project management office. Whereas under Mr. Donahue's leadership, PACE recently announced that the agency would be a zero emission fleet by 2040. Whereas throughout his career, Mr. Donahue has been a continuous advocate for PACE and for transit riders across the region. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Regional Transportation Authority hereby honors Rocky Donahue for his years of conscientious and dedicated service to the people of Northeastern Illinois and for his commitment to enhancing the stability and integrity of the region's public transportation system for all the residents of the region and congratulates him on his retirement from PACE. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, it was cute when Director Ross and I were out in Plainfield uh, this week for the 10th anniversary uh, of Bus on Shoulder, uh, Rocky was continually referred to by local officials uh, there as the face of pace. Uh, and Rocky, you are the, the face of pace. Uh, when you were the governmental affairs chief for pace, you were out there amongst the uh, elected officials in the public day in and day out. Uh, and one other thing that is not in his uh, his resolution that I always admired was um, in a non-paying capacity, Rocky was the chairman of Illinois State University's Board of Trustees, um, a tremendous, tremendously big assignment, which Illinois State uh, has um, really moved forward. It's always been a great institution. But under Rocky's leadership, um, Illinois State University has become 
you know, one of the, the great academic institutions of the United States and uh, is really probably the flagship. I hate to say this as a Western Illinois University graduate, but uh, it is uh, what I would call the Miami of Ohio of uh, the Illinois system. And Rocky, uh, my, my hat's off to you for your leadership and public service uh, at Illinois State University as well. Um, any questions or comments from, from the board other than we so admire his service? Uh, I see no additional hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. Great, I'm Rocky. Sorry. Yeah. There, I'm sorry, Director, there, there, Director yeah. Ross does have a raised hand. Yes, JD. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to compliment Rocky on an outstanding career. I had a chance to express those sentiments to him personally on Monday, but he's really an outstanding guy. And there's one thing that comes to mind for me, it was a year ago at the PACE budget hearing uh, at the library here in Joliet, and they were being asked, Rocky and, and um, his staff were being asked some very tough questions about, about some routes. And I just remember how professionally he handled those questions and how compassionate he was in talking to people who were very passionate about their needs for certain routes to be continued. Just a very, very professional job. So my hats off to you, Rocky. Congratulations on an outstanding career and best wishes to you in retirement. Thank you. And JD, he must have started at Pace when he was six years old. So. <laughs> yes, indeed. What a tremendous career. So with that, I will take it that uh, Director Ross moves and Director Gorman seconds that we adopt this resolution. Rocky, you want to say anything before we uh, we pass this resolution unanimously? Yeah, um, yes, I would. Uh, first of all, thank you. I'm very humbled. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, uh, to all the RTA directors, thank you for, for what you do. Public service and public transportation is so important to our region and our and our state. Um, but but as I tell the pace staff, I really believe I have the easy job, and I believe I have the easy job here today as well. And it's easy because of all the hard work all of you do, because you guys really trail blaze the trail for 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 this region and for RTA and CTA and Metro and Pace. I'm I'm humbled. I'm I'm honored to be there. And if I if I could take a privilege, Mr. Chairman, nothing to do with this resolution, nothing to do with our budget. I, I want to say thank you to Director Sarah Pang. Um, she sent me an email a couple weeks ago that really, really touched me. It was it was uh, truly energizing, truly inspiring, um, very em empathetic. And why I'm saying this is I'm not sure I've ever met Director Pang. Um, and I can confidently tell you if if she walked up to me right now and punched me, I wouldn't even know who punched me. But yet she took the time to to reach out to me and it, it truly inspired me. So so thank you for doing that. And with with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your kind words. And I'm very proud of Ellen, my work at Illinois State too. So if anybody else is out there, go Redbirds. Uh, Rocky. I'm Sarah Pang, and I'll buy you a cup of coffee or a beer or a wine sometime <laughs> soon. And I, I sent the letter because it is rare to run into a brilliant, trusted, passionate, but yet earnest leader. And you are all of that and more. You care so much and you are really brilliant, but you have this earnest way about you that makes you approachable and you can see that when you're in public. So I'm looking forward to uh, toasting you in person. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Well, well said. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Leanne has a raised hand as well. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I know I'm not on the board, but I was trying to jump in there before we actually pass this resolution. And I just wanted to say uh, from me personally, and I think I speak for the staff at RTA as well, um, you know, we are going to miss Rocky's uh, enthusiasm, his commitment, his energy, um, you know, in all things. We've all spent lots of time together over the years. Um, and and I, I we really appreciate that that support and that partner that we've had in the transit space. Uh, and so he will be missed. And I just wanted to personally say thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Leanne, and and for all of you who don't know, Leanne and I share a special bond. We're both huge Springsteen fans. In fact, I've run into Leanne at, at Springsteen concerts in other parts of the country, and we both kind of looked at each other and said, so are you a groupie following Springsteen? Like what? And, you know, and Leanne would blame her husband, and I'd blame my wife, but I think deep down we we both were groupies. And if I can, Mr. Chairman, um, I'll leave you with with some a lyric of Springsteen's that I, I I I try to tell people that really makes sense. And he has a he has a lyric that says, um, talk about your dreams and try to make them real. And that would be my advice to anybody here. Talk about your dreams and make them real. So thank you. Thank you, Rocky. You're a superstar and a great friend. And um, we'll miss you, but stick around and we know where to call you when we need your advice, which we will do. With that, Mr. Secretary or, or Madam Legal Counsel, can I just say uh, all those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 And aye. The aye. Have it. aye. aye. And it is adopted. Uh, thank you, Rocky. You're a class act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to leave, but thank you so much. I, I'm very honored. All right, Mr. Secretary, let's move on to to B, who has our own RTA budget. How am I going to follow that? This is B. Raina Hickey, <laughs> uh, the CFO at the RTA. But you know, first, I would like to thank my fellow CFOs, Ellen Ochab, Jeremy Fine, Lori Newson, and their great finance teams, as well as our own Bill Lackman and, and Doug Anderson for their hard work, collaboration, and quite frankly, candid advice. Um, on this year's challenging budget. You know, we 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 work well together, uh, but I will try to be brief. Um, we don't really have too much. Um, let's start out with, next slide, please. So good morning, members of the RTA board. This is, um, well, I've already said that. The item is presented for discussion purposes only. No action is being requested at this time. On December 16th, the board will consider the RTA agency budget for adoption as part of the 2022 RTA Consolidated Regional Budget and Capital Program. The RTA agency operating budget continues to focus on the three-step recovery strategy in order to proactively respond to the financial and social crisis caused by the pandemic and to prepare for potential challenges ahead. The agency remains focused on the following policy priorities for near and longer term recovery planning. Identify immediate funding solutions, sustain critical transit service, and take an increasingly transparent and collaborative approach to communicating with stakeholders and the public. The RTA agency operating budget contains a gross expense level of 46.6 million, an increase of 3.4 million or 7.9% from the RTA's pre-COVID 2022 plan due to a much higher level of federally funded 5310 projects. The amended 2020 agency budget was funded at 31.7 million, a reduction of 10% from the 35.2 million funding level of the original 2020 budget. The 2021 agency budget maintained this reduced funding level. Due to improving sales tax performance, the proposed 2022 agency budget funding level has been restored to the pre-COVID 2020 budget level of 35.2 million to fund RTA COVID re recovery initiatives, such as the strategic plan update and regional transit advocacy. Nevertheless, the proposed agency budget is still 2.1 million or 5.7 below the funding level anticipated in the pre-COVID 2022 plan. Next slide, please. In 2022, budgeted funding and revenue total 46.6 million as shown on the left. Of that amount, 75.6 or 35.2 million represents regional public funding from the RTA sales tax. The remaining 24.4% or 11.4 million includes grants and other revenue. Budgeted agency expenses also total 46.6 million as shown on the right. The proposed RTA agency budget is developed in two parts, administration and regional programs. Administrative costs account for 37.5% or 17.4 million, which is 42.6 below the 2022 
30.4 million million statutory administrative cap allowed by the RTA Act. The administrative budget includes expenses for personnel, professional services, information technology facilities, and office services that support the funding, planning, and oversight mission of the RTA. The proposed regional program programs budget accounts for the remaining 62.5% or 29.1 million of 2022 agency expenses. Regional programs include regional services and grant and RTA funded projects. Regional services account for 33.8 or 15.7 million. The regional services budget supports services provided to the public, including ADA paratransit, certification, mobility management, and travel training. The RTA The RTA funded regional services and initiatives include the strategic planning update, regional transit advocacy, increased community planning projects, customer satisfaction survey, rebuild Illinois project management oversight and 5310 federally funded projects. These projects account for the remaining 28.8% or 13.4 million. For many of these projects, the RTA acts as an advocate and granting agency receiving funds for the region and then administering grants to the service boards, municipalities and counties for planning projects. Next slide, please. This chart depicts a portion of the agency budget supported by regional funding from the RTA sales tax. We also call this the net operating budget because it reflects expenses less associated revenue and outside funding. Here we compare the 2022 administrative and regional programs proposed budgets to the 2021 amended budget. The 2022 administrative budget is 8.4% higher than the 2021 amended budget due mostly to higher audit fees, legal fees, pension, healthcare benefits, personnel expenses, and IT related expenses such as cybersecurity, in for consulting, software subscription renewal, and new laptops purchases. Total agency headcount is budgeted at 109 positions, four more budgeted positions than in 2021, but it is still four positions fewer than the 2019 budgeted headcount of 113 prior to COVID. The regional programs budget increase, increases by 13.9% or 2.2 million due mostly to RTA COVID recovery initiatives, such as the strategic plan update and regional transit campaigns and increased community planning programs. Thus, the total 2022 RTA agency uh, net operating budget of 35.2 million is expected to increase by 11.1% or 3.5 million from the 2021 amended budget. As I mentioned earlier, the total proposed 2022 RTA agency net operating budget matches the pre-COVID 2020 budget level of 13 of 35.2 million. Next slide, please. The RTA is meeting its Disadvantaged Business Enterprise or DBE participation goal of 16% for federally funded contract. And we exceeded the goal by over 10% in federal fiscal year 2020, which ended in uh, September 30th of 2020. Additionally, we met the RTA DBE participation goal of 12% on non-federally funded contracts in both 2020 and 2021. Starting in April, 2020, the monthly govern government procurement compliance forum forums have been virtual via WebEx and Zoom. Vendor fairs and pre-bid meeting uh, conferences have also gone virtual. This concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, B. Questions on our budget uh, of, of B? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Director Ross has a raised hand, but it may be from a previous, I think it's down now. Okay. Any questions? I don't see any other hands, Mr. Chair. There's nothing else you you all know how I'm to sorry. find me. Yep. I'm sorry, uh, Director Melvin has a raised hand. Yes, Director Melvin. Thank you. Um, thank you, B, for a great report. Um, I really, really want to back up on something and, uh, you know, uh, Directors Indalcio and Lewis have uh, been talking today a lot asking questions about diversity and making making comments about diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, and I just want to sort of lend my voice to their effort. I think, I think, I think it's an important issue. Uh, uh, Director Lewis added governance as a concern. I think that's very appropriate. 
And previously, Director Lewis has made both the civic case and the business case. The civic case, of course, is that we serve a very diverse population. Uh, but the business case is, is that it's well established that people with different experiences, with different walks of life, come together to uh, solve problems. Uh, there's an added depth uh, uh, to, to, the, to the solutions that are provided. So I just want to take this moment and lend my voice to the effort that they've been carrying all morning. Thank you. Well said. All right. Um, so we will uh, we will move on. And she's been so patient, uh, and we really really appreciate it. We'll move on to the update on the activities of the RTA Transit Access Citizens Advisory Board. Jackie Forbes, uh, you deserve an award for sitting through uh, this today. But it's all yours, and we deeply appreciate your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Dillard and members of the Board of Directors. Thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Jackie Forbes and I am the chairperson of the RTA CAB. I'm here to provide an update of the activities of the board. The RTA CAB last met on October 25th, 2021. During the meeting, staff engaged the committee in robust discussions around the strategic plan and the regional budget. Let me begin by talking about the strategic plan. Staff from multiple RTA departments provided an update on the RTA strategic planning work and engaged the RTA CAB members in a workshop to gather input. The goal of the workshop was to ensure the board members were aware of the strategic plan development process, as well to inform them and the groups in the constituencies they represent on when and how to engage with the RTA on this work. During the workshop, staff introduced five topic areas where the RTA will be focusing its efforts in the coming year and guided the board through several questions to solicit input on these topics. The five topic areas included opportunities for transit impact, transit system adaptation to changing needs, funding stability, transit equity, and stakeholder engagement. The RTA CAB was very engaged in this workshop and provided input on all five topic areas. Staff informed us that they would come back for additional input throughout the strategic planning process, and we were happy to provide input on the development of the plan. Uh, next, the RTA CAB was briefed on the 2022 regional budget development process. Douglas Anderson, manager, budget and business analysis, presented this item to the board. He indicated that transit is recovering slowly, which impacts fare revenue and fare box recovery. We heard today. Uh, however, sales tax has rebounded much more quickly than expected, thus providing a more positive outlook. He then reviewed the service board's projected operating expenses for 2022 and the status of the allocation of the three federal relief funding packages. RTA CAB members did not have any questions or comments on the item. Lastly, the RTA CAB adopted its 2022 meeting dates. We will, we will be meeting on January 24th. April 25th, July 25th, and October 24th, all from 10 a.m. until noon. Our next meeting of the RTCAB is on January 24th at 10 a.m. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Jackie, not only for your service, but just uh, patience here today, although you can see we're thorough uh, as, as, one of, as one of our watchdogs. Uh, any questions of Jackie? Comments? I, don't, I don't see any hands. I, I believe Mr. Melvin, our director Melvin, still has a hand up from the previous item. Okay, great. Well, then, thank you, Jackie, so much. Happy, happy, Thanksgiving. happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Uh, the chair's prerogative for the sake of time. Um, we're going to push item 6C, uh, which is our quarterly performance report for the third quarter, and item 7A, the resolution certifying the financial results for the third quarter over to our December meeting, which now leads us to 7B, which is an ordinance authorizing a contract uh, with DEF.com for managed hosting services. Uh, George Coleman, you gonna present this? Yes, thank you, Chairman Dillard. And good afternoon to members of the board. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I've just been asked if there are any questions related to uh, this particular uh, contract. Uh, I'm happy to answer those. But it's basically a three year contract with a company called deft.com, D E F T, to provide managed hosting services for our MHC application. So happy to answer any questions that anyone may have regarding it. 
Great, thanks, George. Just for the public uh, and those watching, uh, obviously it's in our board packet, so uh, we are familiar with uh, with what this is. Any questions of Mr. Coleman? I see no hands at this time, Mr. Chairman. If not, how about a motion and a second? Got a motion by Director Gavin and a second by Director Carey. Thank you. And with that, uh, will you please take the roll, Mr. Secretary? Yes. Director Andalcia? Aye. Director Canty? Aye. Director Carey? Aye. Director Colson? Aye. Director Fuentes? Aye. Director Gavin? Aye. Director Gorman? Aye. Director Groven? Aye. Director Holt? Aye. Director Cotel? Aye. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Melvin? Yes. Director Pang? Yes. Yes. Director Ross? Director Ro Ross? Leave Director, Ro uh, Director Ross had to leave the meeting. Yeah. Director Sager? Yes, and with the chairman's approval, I would like to add my yes. I think there were technical difficulties with the approval of the minutes. So, the, the record will still reflect. Yeah. And uh, yes, Chairman sir. Billy. Yes, I. Uh, Fifteen sir. eyes and one absent, Mr. Chairman. So that uh, that ordinance is approved. We've done seven C. Uh, let's move on to item seven D, which is an approval of a travel expense uh, reimbursement. How about a motion and a second on this one? Motion by Director Indalcio, second by Director Groven. Thank you. Will you take the roll on that, Mr. Secretary, please? Yes. Director Indalcio. Aye. Director Canty. Aye. Director Carey. Aye. Director Colson. Aye. Director Fuentes. Aye. Director Gavin. Aye. Director Gorman. Aye. Director Groven. Aye. Director Holt. Aye. Director Cotel. Aye. Director Lewis. Yes. Director Melvin. Yes. Director Pang. Yes. Director Ross. Director Sager. Yes. Chairman Dillard. Aye. Uh, 15 eyes, one absent, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So 7D is approved. Item 8 is new business. Any new business to uh, be raised today? Uh, not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Then uh, we'll move on to adjournment. As a reminder, our next board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, December 16th at 9 a.m. Uh, if there's no further business to come before the public session of the Board of Directors, uh, I'll entertain a motion and a second to adjourn. A motion by Director Groven and a second by Director Lewis. Thank you, and and thanks everyone for your uh, your patience on this uh, very very in, important topic uh, of primarily the budget today. Uh, so with that, uh, all those in favor, uh, say aye, aye. Opposed, nay. The aye. ayes have it. Aye, aye. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.